Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our ninth annual rare disease event that's being held at the Broad Institute. It is my pleasure to be co-hosting this event for the third year in a row with the Termir Foundation. You may have noticed that I am not, in fact, Anna Greca, unfortunately. Anna is under the weather today, so I am stepping in. But I think I am qualified because I've worked hand in hand with Anna over the last four years. Um, I'm a neuroscientist by training and a scientific advisor here at the Broad, where I'm helping Anna along with a massive community of Brodies and people in the broader ecosystem create this new initiative called Ladders to Cures, focused on identifying nodal disease biology and rare diseases. Um, and I'll tell you about that later in the program. I'm really thrilled to welcome you all here today. Thank you for braving the inclement weather and for joining us here in person and also to our lively online community. Um, we're really here to celebrate you know, the amazing progress in our community and also to foster new connections, make new friends, um, and really talk about never before seen approaches to understanding rare diseases and developing therapies. I really don't need to tell this audience that more than 200 million people worldwide, mostly children, have a rare genetic disease. And while there are incredible success stories, fewer than 500 currently have an available treatment despite an understanding of greater than 8,000 disease-causing genes. The speed, accessibility, and low cost of sequencing has now made the diagnosis of rare genetic diseases easier than ever, but that diagnostic odyssey can be arduous and lengthy, and many families are left without further answers despite a diagnosis because treatments don't yet exist. One reason, I'm gonna reach in here, that we can point to wins and therapies for Gaucher and Pompe's disease is in large part due to the efforts of Henry Tamir, the man on the screen who led Genzyme as CEO for 27 years and pioneered groundbreaking treatments for rare diseases. Uh, while reading the book from our speaker today, James Garrity, Inside the Orphan Drug Revolution, I learned that Carl Feldbaum, leader of Bio, once said that if there were a Nobel Prize for an entrepreneur with heart, Henry would have received it. Before I continue with the additional details about today's event, it is my great pleasure to introduce Belinda Tremir, the president and co-founder of the Tremir Foundation, who is empowering the next generation of rare disease-focused entrepreneurs through the rare disease, through the Tremir Fellows Program, and many of them are in this room, um, and we'll be hearing from several of them today. Please join me in welcoming Belinda Tremir to the Broad for opening remarks. Thank you, Jillian. Um, hello, everyone, and I would also like to welcome you today um, to the 2024 Rare Disease Day event, Climbing Ladders to Cures. I'd like to start by thanking the Broad Institute for their partnership on this event, specifically Drs. Anna Greca and Jillian Shaw, as the Tremere Foundation is honored to continue collaborating on Rare Disease Day. As I mentioned last year, Rare Disease Day um, was chosen on Henry's birthday, so this was his birthday, so I still have a big place in my heart for this day. Um, our work at the foundation is to sustain leaders so that ladders can be climbed, to deliver more for patients. Thank you to all of today's speakers and everyone in the audience for your commitment to the patients and to this industry around the world. The Tamir Foundation was founded to continue the legacy of my husband. For many, he was an inspirational leader. Our goal is to connect life science innovators, biotech entrepreneurs, CEOs, and visionaries because we believe that helping leaders succeed will ultimately help their innovations reach patients. We believe in the work of everyone in this room and are, and are honored to play a role in amplifying the voices of rare disease researchers, discoverers, and CEOs. We recognize how important it is to foster community and collaboration in this space. Days like today remind us to pause and come together. With that, we are inviting everyone to join us in partnership, skill, and knowledge sharing towards driving impact and change in the lives of rare disease patients and families. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Belinda. So we have a packed lineup. Um, you're gonna hear some incredible stories today from citizen scientists, rare disease parents, pioneers in biotech, and scientists who are figuring out ways to deliver new therapies to the brain um, and increase our understanding of interpreting the human genome. 
An event like this does not take place without the hard work of a small army of scientists and dedicated people. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Anna Greca for launching the Rare Disease Day event at the Broad nine years ago and really inspiring audacious rare disease focused projects um, that seemingly <laughs> require the expertise of almost everyone in this building and the broader um, rare disease ecosystem. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our incredible partners um, at the Tremere Foundation, Belinda, Catherine Smith, um, Alan Waltz, Erica, Dan. Uh, without you, none of this would be possible. Um, I'd personally like to thank Katie Ligori, our graphic designer and operations specialist, who has a gift for building community and is really the glue that ties us all together. Um, she allows us to focus on the science. I'd also like to say, if you run into anything today, Katie has graciously agreed to be our point person, so please don't hesitate to contact her. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank all of today's speakers who are up late into the night perfecting slides to share with you today and who have devoted their life's work to making a difference um, and to making the world a better place for rare disease patients. Here at the Broad, I'd like to thank our incredible events team, as well as our tech team, who all deserve Academy Awards for the behind the scenes work that's taking place to, to bring today's event to fruition. Um, I'd also like to thank our Broad leadership and Todd Golub in particular for making rare disease research here at the institution a priority. And finally, I'd like to thank this community um, to each and every one of you for showing up and making time and space to really move the needle on what's possible in rare disease research. I promise we'll get started with the program. A handful of housekeeping notes. Um, we've scheduled some time for each of our speakers to answer questions. We want today to be very interactive. So at the end, I'll ask our speakers to moderate a Q&A back and forth. Um, if you're joining us online, please feel free to put your questions into the chat and our wonderful postdoc Magdalena, a pediatric nephrologist, will be moderating our Q&A. Um, finally, um, you know, we have mics in the room, so please feel free to take advantage of that, or if you want to remain anonymous, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, all right, so let's kick off the program for this, this year's Rare Disease Day. Um, I am honored to introduce Dr. Winston Yen this afternoon, who is a founding member and president of the N of One Collaborative and co-founder and head of translational strategy at Arbor Biotechnologies. He is also a 2023 Tremere Scholar. Winston is motivated to bring the promise of genetic medicines to help the broadest range of patients, in particular those with ultra-rare, in a few genetic diseases that otherwise would be too rare to attract commercial interest. The N of One Collaborative is a nonprofit that serves as an independent, neutral hub to enable sharing best practices, communal resources, and data, all to accelerate the creation of safe, rigorous, and scalable drug development. Winston completed his PhD from Harvard University, working with Feng Zhang at the Broad Institute on early CRISPR genome editing technology development. It is my pleasure to introduce Winston. Thank you, everyone. It's, Anna was one of my advisors in the MD-PhD program. I, I've always loved how she communicates science, so it's a tough act to follow even uh, virtually. So um, thank you, Catherine, for this introduction. So I'm here to talk to you about today um, about ultra-rare diseases. And Catherine gave a brief intro to my background, but I wanted to share a bit more about why I'm here talking to you about this today. So as I mentioned, I, I did my PhD upstairs um, in the Zhang lab. And this was, you know, always gives me goosebumps coming back here and talking in front of this audience. Um, I was fortunate enough to work in the beginning of the CRISPR revolution. Um, and that was an incredible just insight into what's, what's possible with genetic medicine. How can we build a platform that can be used to treat uh, potentially multiple genetic diseases with a single tool? From there, uh, I was a co-founder of Arbor Biotechnologies. I am a co-founder. Um, where we, the idea is how do we find more CRISPR tools by mining the diversity of nature? Can we bring more treatments to patients um, that are sourced from natural diversity? But the reason why I'm here to tell you about rare genetic disease is because after starting my, um, doing my PhD, completing it, 
starting Arbor for four years, I actually went back to finish my medical degree. And it was there in walking around the hospitals, you know, in literally down the street, that I just happened to, you know, things happened multiple, multiple times to me that um, spurred my interest and appreciation for the challenge as well as the opportunity within rare ge genetic disease. So what happened was I was at Boston Children's Hospital. We are on a genetics rotation. Um, we're walking into the ICU. And we're walking to the ICU because we have a genetic diagnosis in hand. Nowadays, a child can come into the ICU and get a sequencing result. Um, they get their exome sequence. If you're lucky, seven days later, you may have an answer. And a medical student might actually be the one who's coming to deliver you that answer with the team. So I'm walking up, proud of hopefully giving some answers to that patient. Um, we walk into the room. We tell the parents about what's going on. And I'm standing there. Maybe the, the, the parents are thankful, and they say, what next? Maybe they discovered a hint of optimism in my voice. And here I was. I literally have eight years of working on this programmable technology that's supposed to treat multiple genetic diseases, and I didn't have an answer. They were one of maybe a dozen mutations uh, in, in the world. And what I realized is the things that everyone in this room talked about, what Anna talked about here. There's these 10,000 rare genetic diseases, or 10,000 rare diseases, and 80% of them are genetic. That's that 8,000 number. And we're discovering more by the day. Literally, we're discovering more genetic diseases than we know what to do with. What I also knew from biotech is that most of these genetic diseases, unfortunately, if we go about business as usual, they're not going to have treatments. There's this line, even though this area under curve is massive, there's actually a line of what is considered commercially viable. Most of the treatments that we have are to the left of that line, but most of the patients are actually to the right of that line. So I had this naive question of saying, well, what if we, if we get an approved CRISPR therapy, which we now do have, can we retarget that? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. There's the microphone. Good? OK, yep. Sorry for those online. Um, so I had a naive question of saying, why can't we just retarget a CRISPR therapy once it's approved? It turns out this had already been done, just not using CRISPR. This was work from um, Tim Yu. And what I'm describing here is foundational work that's built on decades of, of hard, hard drug development for a drug called nusinersen, also known as Spinraza. This is used to treat spinal muscular atrophy, and it was approved in 2016. It's based on something called an antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO, as I'll be talking about. And what Tim had the insight of is that in meeting a young girl with a rare genetic mutation for neurodegenerative disease, Tim said, huh, that, that mutation is amenable to the same mechanism as Spinraza. Can I reprogram it and help her in an N of 1 fashion? There's a simple elegance to this. That is Spinraza on the left, and that's Milicin, named after Mila, this young girl on the right. We're reprogramming something so that it can now be a tailored, bespoke medicine. And this captured the imagination of, of everyone who's been dreaming about you know, individualized treatments, personalized medicines. So the question be then becomes, how can, we, how can we actually take this process where in one year we went from seek to treat, right? We have a sequencing and identification of this mutant in, what was it, Tim? February of, or March of 2017. Tim's sitting right here, by the way. And then Mila was dosed in February of 2018. So this is remarkable. These are like land speed records for drug development. And the question really becomes, how can we encapsulate this process and make it just repeatable? Can we turn the crank to help more patients? And in a nutshell, yes. There are meetings with the FDA that resulted in four guidances about specifically using antisense oligonucleotides for, um, you know, in this individualized context. That resulted in 10 to 15 more treatments from investigators around the world. And truly, this is a trickle. So I don't think we can, it's too few to say we have achieved any sort of victory but it's enough to light a fire of what's possible. So the other thing I want to show you is that more 
programmable genetic medicines are on the horizon. We have CRISPR and all of its different flavors, base editing, prime editing. Um, we have antisense oligos. There's RNA editing here. This is not a talk about any of those specific modalities. It's not about ASOs. It's not about CRISPR. It's, it's about if we are in the age of these modular genetic medicines, can we make treatments and turn the act of drug development from a, soft, from a hardware problem into a software problem? Can we do that and actually help that long tail of ultra-rare disease? So one thing that we thought about uh, very carefully is how do we actually make this happen? There's a very unique property of platforms in that you can learn by doing where the N of many can actually help the N of few and vice versa. So what that is is if you're a biopharma company, you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to make your first approved therapy. Um, and that knowledge takes the form of state-of-the-art design, your CMC and manufacturing processes, toxicity, and just experience working with that particular agent. Why not give academic investigators who are working hard to treat patients that state-of-the-art knowledge? Why can't they benefit from the same technologies that are being used in the commercializable indications? But there's a reverse loop that's also true. When you learn at an individual patient level, you get to learn far more about your platform than with just one drug. I actually asked a, a C-suite member of a large biopharma company, would you rather have 3,000 patients who are treated with the same drug or 3,000 different treatments each for one patient? Where would you learn more? He says, it's obvious. It's a ladder. And so there's this loop that can be closed that makes this a win-win situation. It's so easy as biotech just to say no. It's like, nah, this is too risky. We don't want to do it. But you can not only treat and help patients, but you can actually learn better and get additional treatments in your pipeline better um, with this learning loop. And time is money in biotech. There are challenges. This is non-obvious. Uh, but when, when we think about ultra-rare disease, you're already dealing with a heterogeneous population. It's you know, different diseases that you're grouping together and trying to treat with the same technology. But what's more, they're happening all around the world. So they can be siloed. And that those silos limit the sharing knowledge that's actually necessary to, to learn and to have that iterative loop. So an important thing to do is create standards. How do you actually build the framework so that there's a process by which everyone is following? And so then when you actually look at all of those data from disparate trials, um, they start to make sense. And sometimes only when you look at things in aggregate, can these emergent properties like toxicity, class-wide effects start to become obvious. That's what's needed. Those data packages are what's needed for regulators to actually start streamlining the, the approval process for these ultra-rare treatments. The other thing is safety. And one of the things is with N of 1s, that patient in front of you is it. There are no do-overs you have to be able to learn in real time, or as close to us as possible, um, actionable things that are able to affect your treatment of that one patient in front of you. And so ultimately, when we think about the NFU, there needs to be a cultural shift in how we think about drug development. Instead of thinking about it as we are all working in our institutes and making sure that we're you know, trying to outcompete the other ones, whether to a, a patent or a publication, there is a world of open source drug development that needs to happen in order to make the safest and best drugs for these patients. So that's what the N of 1 Collaborative is founded to do. We want to solve these collaborative challenges. And Erica, um, er, sorry, Catherine touched on our, our, our mission of how our goal is to be the rising tide that floats all boats. And to do those, there's three pillars of our, our activities. One is aligning and sharing best practices. The other is using those to create high quality data sets that are, that are refined and all standardized. The third is how do we convene discussion so that we can continue to iterate and improve the practice of genetic medicines. These three are actually interlinked in important ways. When you have best practice that reinforces better data collection, those better data then are able to create better iterative learnings to inform the updated practices and so on and so forth. 
So we just started in 2022. Since then, we already have 500 members worldwide. There's seven work groups that are about all the key challenges that are unique to N of ones that we now have 65 volunteers working across. We've built databases, data sharing agreements, um, publications. And again, all, it's all to, as a public resource to be able to grow this field for the benefit of patients and you know, researchers. So now I'll finally get to why the title of my talk, The Dawn of Interventional Genetics. Why is it interventional genetics? And why not something like genetic medicines or gene therapies? I pose to you that the, the procedural model that this implies actually has a real importance. So imagine this. You have uh, you know, a blockage in a coronary artery. You see a cardiac surgeon uh, or interventional cardiologist. The clinician works with you to develop the best approach. They tailor it to your anatomy. They tailor it to your disease history. And they tailor it to your desires of treatment. They then create a treatment plan where they go and partner, or they don't partner, they purchase a tool from industry. That tool is not soldered in a laboratory of the, of the surgeon. That is professionally developed. That's regulated by the FDA. And that is a you know, state-of-the-art tool for treating that specific disease. The clinician delivers that treatment and that provides the follow-up. So think about a future here where we have interventional genetics. You receive a genetic diagnosis. You meet an interventional geneticist. This is a new specialty. We'll have to have you know, the training in it. But there's a specialist who they look at your genome. They look at your health, your goals of treatment. They have all the knowledge of what are the different technologies that are available to make that particular correction. From there, they go into, they partner with biotechs. They work, in, can, they work with established industry sources of these custom genetic medicines um, where you know, everything is state of the art, just like that catheter the preclinical design, the manufacturing, the clinical standards, and then treatment is delivered. So there's key precedents here where we're really thinking about it as the whole treatment, it's a process. And, and that's key here, just the process is the product. We're going to keep on driving that with these genetic medicines that ultimately we're not talking about individual medicines of approving them each at a time. Can we start making this entire process of treatment, um, this rigorous, repeatable process. So key things for us to learn here is that surgeons, the FDA doesn't regulate surgeries. They, but clearly, there are guidelines. And that comes from self-governance from peers, whether it's professional societies, uh, you know, credentialing, and the institution. The other is that, um, like I mentioned, the regulatory agencies do have input. They provide guardrails of what that device has to be. They provide the specs of anything that's made and then goes into the human body. There's clearly criteria that influence that. that. Then the other thing is just how medicine is practiced. Surgeons clearly learn and improve over time. They don't often do randomized clinical trials. right? So there's clearly a way that we can do treatment with iterative learnings and still move forward the process of both understanding disease and biology, as well as understanding clinical medicines, um, just not necessarily with RCTs and, you know, uh, or compassionate use. The last thing is an important one, the business model. If you think about surgeons, surgery departments, and the devices, device companies, there clearly is a business model that sustains them over time. Why can't the same be the case for interventional genetics? So I'm going to um, just briefly extend this analogy to say we have this graphic of the N of 1 collaborator in the middle, but it could just as well be an American surgical, the College of Surgeons, right? They're providing the exact same um, standards and guidelines to guide the practice of a process. And if we can use history as a guide, perhaps there's learnings we can take there to extend that analogy more fully. What, can, what did they do that fostered the growth and development of potentially a nascent field that required um, that uh, shepherding to make it rigorous and able to deliver treatments? What are things we should proactively implement today so that we can provide the foundations of a successful uh, future? 
So I'm going to end on two slides. One is there is, I think this vision is possible. There's a future where every single child, adult, you name it, when they receive a genetic diagnosis that actually already comes with a genetic intervention. This is still incredibly early. We are at the start of this. Um, I looked on the American Transplant Society's website, and in 1954, the first transplant was done. It was a kidney transplant. Last year, in to, uh, two years ago now, in 2022, there were a total of a million transplants in total done so, since 1954. And in 2021, there were 40,000 transplants done. I would bet you that if you went back to 1954 and said, we just took this kidney from one person and we're putting in another person, that would have been insane to think about. So I think we are in the early stages of this field, and we have to work together and build the necessary structure um, to help these millions of rare disease patients. So here's the last slide. This is Kendall Square. If you think about where we are today, literally, we're standing and sitting here at the Broad. It's the epicenter where so many of the most powerful genetic technologies have originated, right? We're within probably a, you know, a two-mile radius of that with Harvard and MIT. That, in turn, has seeded some of the most successful biopharma companies known to man. And then we're all right next to some of the greatest academic medical centers in the world. So I pose to you, Henry started the rare disease revolution. Can we finish what he started? And can we do this together with all of the, the resources around us? So that's it. It's a concept talk. Um, I'll leave this last slide up here as what can you do today? But please reach out and see how we can work together. Thank you. So you have time for questions. So with this uh, AI revolution that's happening, um, and uh, LLMs being a thing, large language models, do you feel like eventually there would be kind of this like almost a doctor in your pocket type application or like, um, where it can basically all the all the, basically all the information in the world would be kind of combined in this like really yeah. robust platform. Um, I think there's so many different ways in which AI can influence the diagnosis and treatment of rare disease. Um, I think the doctor in your pocket that integrates all of the information from genomic to phenotype to wearables. I think that's a very powerful one. Um, I think for interventional genetics, there's uh, I think of it as um, one necessity and one key use case. One necessity is AI is only as good as the data that's trained on, right? So if we're trying to make sure that the data goes in and helps influence the next generation of treatments, um, that has to be captured in a structured way, that has to have the right metadata, that has to be fed in in a thoughtful way that is already with the end use case in mind of how do you make better treatments you know, iteratively. The second thing is I think there's a value in, in AI, especially when you think about how do you do a controlled trial with one person, right? Um, is there a world in which you actually collect a baseline on a given patient and, and model it like a digital, like a virtual twin or a digital natural history of saying, this is what happened if that um, individual did not receive treatment. Again, you're basing that information off of physiology, all these different parameters. And here, with treatment, we see that the curve bent or the things. And you can really help drive the, um, you know, the efficacy. Like, how are you able to, um, convince regulators and, and, frankly, patients and providers that giving them this experimental new molecular entity is actually doing something, um, yeah, doing something that's different from the natural disease course. Hi. Um, I was wondering where payers are in this picture. Um, so rare disease treatment in general is commercially viable. And if that prevalence plot that you showed in the beginning is true and the regulatory environment is favorable, in principle, um, this should be commercially viable. But um, it's unclear to me like where the payers come in, like where is health insurance and where are, or socialized medicine. Mm -hmm. Have those conversations been initiated? And is there 
um, sort of receptiveness to this idea of N of one treatments from payers? Yeah, so that's one of the things we, we think about very deeply in our um, access and sustainability working group. Clearly, someone has to pay for these somehow. And um, I think there's maybe, this is a complex conversation I would love to follow up on. Um, maybe two key points. One is that um, if we think about this as more of a process, are there ways in which you can drive the cost of goods down just by building it on top of um, you know, existing manufacturing processes, existing um, you know, just economies of scale that are used for commercial treatments? Um, I'll give you an example. Right now, the cost of developing a lifetime supply of antisense oligos is around, you know, it's like the cost of a BMW, right? Like $50,000. Um, all the rest of it actually is a lot, it's, um, you know, drug development, you're trying to recruit R&D costs. But if you're saying, I have this platform, and now the cost of goods is really just that, um, you know, the new price, you can be able to um, accept, instead of saying $100 million for 10 patients, right, that's clearly not a sustainable price. You can say, for those 10 patients, I can charge a, a more, you know, like measurable or, I don't know, more uh, reasonable amount uh, sum there. And the second really quick point is that, um, I think this is the thing that the entire field is grappling with, of these in incredibly expensive but life-changing medicines. How do you pass, like, how do you actually price that benefit into, uh, you know, our health insurance model with different you know, people bouncing around every two years between health insurance? Um, how does Medicare think about it? How does that differ in a, differ in a country with socialized medicine like the NHS. Um, those are things I think in the next 10 years we're going to figure out, and this entire field will benefit from it um, once there's that streamlining of a uh, process. Yeah, thanks. And we don't understand them. Uh, it can be a gain or a loss of function, and you know that that really affects the outcome for a potential therapeutic, or at least it can. So how do, how do you think about that? Yeah. So Casper's question was how do you, how do you uh, affect how do you evaluate efficacy models, especially for these de novo mutations? I would challenge that for the entire room. Like literally, the Broad community is so well powered to to solve these problems in a scaled up way. Um, you know, maybe that that's kind of punting the problem. My thinking on it is that um, this comes into patient selection. Right? There, there may be some mutations in the beginning that the benefit risk isn't there, because we don't know what a given intervention will do. Will this you know, splice modulating ASO actually cause a toxic um, you know, haploinsufficiency and stuff? Like there's, there's things that we may not know. And therefore, it's a conversation with both the patient the provider, maybe like a, a board of uh, advising clinicians of whether that is wise to ap approach that. When we then can uncover more about treatment, uh, you know, when we can actually understand the benefit risks more, I think that's where you can start um, pushing into a, a bit more uh, unknown biology, or I should say not unknown. The biology should be fixed, but if there's a safety profile that looks good from your, your other things, that calculus changes on the individual level. who seem comfortable testing safety in rats. But if you look at Ionis, they won't administer drugs that haven't been tested in non-human primates, which becomes not a viable solution in general for N of ones. So the question is, how do you think about that other than to hope for an in vitro assay that will correlate with toxicity? I mean, I think one of the problems with that is there's not a large enough N in non-human primates to be able to do adequate testing for safety and compare it to rats or human neurons or, you know, so that's sort of the, the dilemma. Yeah, it's, I think the crux of the question is just how, as you're perturbing different new molecular entities, are you able to capture the safety profile as a class and, and 
and like, what are some assays that are actually uh, informative of it? That's a very hard question. I mean, just saying, I mean, if you had better predictive models uh, for that, the entire drug development industry would benefit from that as well, because you could compress so much of the cost. Um, I think right now, um, this gets back to how are we able to explore the variable space by gathering more N on more compounds um, that have actually made it to the clinic. Right now, how many ASOs have, have been approved? Maybe like less than 10? So we have inhuman data for very few of them. So we don't even have the ability to loop back that, um, to close that loop. If we have situations where the benefit risk makes sense, especially in cases where the, benefit, the, the risk of not treating is death, can we use that as, a, as um, well, well, and again, this is important to say, there are rigorous scientific um, experiments that we're doing to actually collect that data and help inform the safety models in a broader way. So I think it's actually opportunity that we're describing with the N of ones in that case. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, so I was wondering if the treatments that were um, developed from the model treatment, like Spinraza, if it's always going to be the like, same method of administration, because I know for some with SMA, the intrathecal injection was kind of a, a barrier to that to um, that treatment. Yeah, so I, I think with platform, what you're describing is a nuance uh, of, of it. Is I, I do think it's important to keep as many things alike as possible. So in this case, the route of administration with the intrathecal injection is important. And that's also why, for most of the early N of 1s, you're seeing that in the CNS and, and neuro. I think a CRISPR N of 1 could actually look very different, right? Because you're starting off in hematopoietic stem cells. You're doing, you know, with the Kastjevi being approved, right? That's um, a process that's now been developed in that particular organ system that you can then modify. So I think many parts of it, in order to maximize the, um, you know, the platform aspect, to, to really build on top, like stand on top of the shoulders of the industry, you have that, um, you want to be able to find diseases in given organ systems that they already have that um, safety package and, and the usability. With time, that might change. Um, and also, hopefully, with time, there'll be way more organ systems that are accessible um, because of uh, drug development progress. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. It's always such a treat to hear from you. I'll also add the N of One Collaborative is phenomenal, and I personally look forward to their talks every week. So I would want to encourage everyone to sign up, join the conversation, and continue the work here. Um, next up, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Michelle Rengarajan, who's a physician scientist who studies single cell sequencing and uses multi-omics to understand and treat autoimmune endocrinopathies. Um, I'm also delighted to report that she has officially opened the doors of her own lab at Mass General Hospital over the past several weeks, um, so it's official. Um, in addition to serving as an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School and an endocrinologist at MB MGH, Michelle specializes in treating endocrine disorders with a particular focus on thyroid disorders, endocrine autoimmunity, and immunotherapy toxicities. She's prepared incredible remarks today, and I'll also say I look forward to every email I get from Michelle because she has an amazing capacity to galvanize the community and go to multiple stakeholders before she comes to you with a question or answer, and I'm really looking forward to her talk today. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much, Jillian, for that introduction. And thank you all so much for being here and really committing yourselves to this incredibly important and incredibly challenging endeavor of revolutionizing care for rare diseases. Um, so about a year ago, I was at what really felt like a pinnacle of my professional career. Um, I'd reached the end of my very long training as a physician scientist and was on the faculty job market. And things were going well. It really felt like I was at the top of the mountain and getting a whole new view of the world. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
Um, but at the same time at home, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were missing something about my older son. And this really came to a head when I was watching a video from his music class. Um, my son loves music, and he was rocking out. But he was rocking out without picking up his feet. And every other kid in that class was jumping off the floor with both feet off the ground. This was the beginning of an extraordinarily painful journey um, in which we learned that our sons, like about one out of every 4,000 boys, carried a mutation in the dystrophin gene that gave them a disorder called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, dystrophin is a, sorry, pointer. Oh, dystrophin is a large structural protein um, that um, is the core member of a multi-protein complex that sits at the skeletal muscle membrane and connects it to the cytoskeleton. And it plays a critical role in force transduction, muscle integrity, and prevention of contraction-mediated uh, muscle damage. Um, the normal gene is the largest gene in the body. It's 2.4 million base pairs on the X chromosome. And because of this, it accumulates a really wide variety of mutations, both in location and type. And so when we think about reaching therapies for every individual with Duchenne, these challenges writ large are the same challenges that we're facing when we think about ultra-rare disease more generally. Um, about two-thirds of, of individuals with Duchenne have um, a large deletion in which one or more exons are deleted. Um, sorry. Okay, I'm having some pointer issues, so I guess I'll use my hands. Um, one or more exons are deleted, um, leading to an um, interruption in the reading frame of the transcript that in turn leads to transcript instability, loss of expression, and destabilization of this critical membrane complex, um, ultimately leading to contraction-mediated skeletal muscle damage. And the consequences of this damage are dire. So, Individuals like my sons have ongoing cardiac and skeletal muscle damage that starts in utero and continues for the rest of their lives. And the consequences of this are loss of the ability to walk, typically between the ages of 10 and 12, a requirement for non-invasive ventilation in the late teens, and the consequent frailty, as well as ongoing cardiac damage, leads to death from heart failure that classically occurs in the mid to late 20s, but even now in 2024 in Massachusetts, still causes children to die in their early to mid-teens. Um, there is no cure for Duchenne, and there's not really effective therapy. So standard of care is high-dose glucocorticoids, um, which do delay the loss of ambulation, but come with a host of really difficult side effects. Um, many of you may have heard of microdystrophins, which are miniaturized versions of the critical components of the dystrophin protein encapsulated in an AAV. Um, Sarepta's drug um, was recently received accelerated approval only for children who are age four or five. Um, and a huge challenge here is seropositivity. So up to 60% of individuals may have prior exposure to AAV um, from just living in the world. Um, and that's a contraindication for otherwise eligible patients. There are some mutation-specific approaches. I'll just point out that the current approved treatments have really minimal muscle delivery, and so their efficacy and approval is incredibly controversial. And finally, there are additional drugs that are either in or expected to be in clinical trials, but I'll point out that from the perspective of a parent, um, the pipeline for drug development is extraordinarily slow. Um, so even a relatively fast example, Sarepta's microdystrophin took six years from IND to accelerated approval, and we're anticipating that it will take another four years for completion of the phase three trials that will actually tell us if this drug is efficacious across the spectrum of Duchenne. Um, so this began to feel not like a mountain, but like a false summit, where I was looking out at a completely different landscape from anything I'd ever known. Um, and yet, in this landscape, the goal is still abundantly clear. Um, we want to see permanent, full-length dystrophin replacement in every affected tissue, and we want to repair existing damage to muscle. And so as I began to think about what my role looked like in this landscape, um, I realized that people are working on this ultimate goal. And I could be another person working on the ultimate goal. But the odds were that I wouldn't be able to achieve that in time for my children or for people living with this disease now. And so if we really want to bring everyone along, we have to think about ways to shorten the path to that mountain um, and to buy time for people living with this disease now. Um, and so as Jillian mentioned, my lab is very new. And so I'm going to talk to you guys about the vision that we have um, 
to, to forge these paths. And we're really looking for partners and collaborators in all of this space. Um, so I'll talk about three things. First, how do we broaden exon skipping approaches to ultra rare mutations? How do we address this issue, or how might we address this issue of pre-existing immunity to AAV? And finally, these are paths, but can we shorten the whole valley um, by developing improved non-invasive readouts of disease progression? Um, so I'll start there. So why do we need to speed up this process? Um, let's talk about what the structure of these clinical trials look like. So the gene therapy trials in Duchenne are 18-month placebo-controlled trials. They enroll ambulatory children who are four to seven years old. There's nothing magical about four. That's just the age at which sponsors have decided that children are um, old enough to participate in the trial endpoints. And that's because these endpoints are largely motor scales, like the North Star Ambulatory Assessment, which is a 17-component motor scale um, that features instructions like, can you step onto the top of the box using your right leg first? I'm going to ask you guys to raise your hand if you've ever met a four-year-old boy. <laughs> and keep your hand up if you think it's a good idea that in 2024, Clinical trials of a fatal progressive disease are dependent on the ability of that four-year-old boy to follow 17 directions. <laughs> so we need something better. Um, and what we are hoping to pursue in my group, along with others, is to adapt the kind of liquid biopsy approaches that have been pioneered um, in oncology to study tissue damage in Duchenne. And in particular, we hope to be able to non-invasively read out skeletal and cardiac muscle damage by borrowing um, experimental techniques for extracellular vesicle and cell-free DNA profiling to classify damage to these specific tissues. We want to be able to track trajectories of individual patients, and we really hope to do that by pairing with natural history studies that have been following patients for years, and training classifiers on biopsy clinical and imaging trajectories. So we're building trajectory markers. Um, and our hope is that in doing this, we'll be able to identify robust and dynamic markers that read out disease progression, and consequently, the efficacy of therapeutic interventions over a time scale of months. And I'll point out we're working very closely with Shannon Stott at MGH on extracellular vesicle isolation, but are really eager to find collaborators spanning this space. Um, so moving on to therapeutics, um, how do we address this issue of people who can't get AAV because of prior exposure? So environmental exposure to AAV um, has been looked at in a number of different settings. Estimates uh, range wildly and are clearly geographically dependent. Um, but can be up to 60% of patients who would otherwise be eligible for therapy. Um, this is primarily defined as seropositivity, so the presence of either neutralizing or um, total binding antibodies to AAV. And the concern here is that these neutralizing antibodies inhibit viral transduction and prevent transgene expression, leading to a lack of efficacy. But alternatively, that the presence of a memory response could unleash a really um, dramatic and um, um, a potentially lethal inflammatory event. Um, I also want to point out that this is really a pan-disease problem. So it's an SMA problem, it's a hemophilia problem. Um, and even though we've had some really exciting progress here at the Broad, as well as other places, in engineering better targeting AAVs, these likely still share immunogenicity with their parent strain. And yet at the same time, um, we've seen a revolution in the kinds of drugs that are available to selectively target the immune system. And I think one of the challenges here has been because medicine and science can get really siloed, the people who are developing and using these immunomodulatory drugs are not necessarily the same people who are developing and using AAV. Um, I think the Broad and the greater Boston medical community is really uniquely situated to create a cross-disease, cross-specialty working group on this issue to try to identify a targeted, short-term combination therapy that can solve this seropositivity issue and really bring together people from the world of AAV and disease-specific biology, as well as immunologists with um, expertise in viral immunology and autoimmunity. Um, and the potential payoff here is actually quite huge. So we have the capacity to up to double the number of people who are eligible for existing approved gene therapies. 
Um, we are likely to find things that may in the future facilitate redosing of gene therapy. And finally, this has the potential to lead to insight into modulating immune tolerance more broadly, um, even beyond rare diseases, into other areas of medicine. Um, I'm going to end by focusing on exon skipping, and this really gets to many of the issues that were raised by Winston in his talk. How do we take mutation-specific approaches from common mutations to ultra-rare ones? Um, so first, I just want to recap what exon skipping is in this context. So here I'm showing you an exon diagram of full-length dystrophin. Um, and if we zoom in, um, I'll remind you that in out-of-frame DMD mutations, we have deletions of one or more exons that alter the reading frame and lead to transcript instability. Um, with exon skipping, um, we use antisense oligos that target a splice donor, acceptor, or enhancer site to splice out an additional exon um, and restore the reading frame, creating a sort of dystrophin light, so a dystrophin with an internal deletion. Um, we've known for a long time from human genetic data um, that some internal, internally deleted dystrophins can be extremely functional. And the classic example of this is a family that was reported by Kay Davies' lab in 1990, um, in which multiple members were missing a huge chunk of the coding sequence from exon 17 to 48. Um, one member of this family was 61 and still walking with a stick. Another had died of an unrelated cause at 52, but was still walking. Um, and the third was a 25-year-old, and this is my personal favorite line in this paper, quote, with the upper body of a weight trainer, which he is. <laughs> uh, so this is really remarkable. And actually, we here are poised to discover many more of these examples as more and more um, ostensibly healthy individuals get whole genome sequencing. So for this crowd, I'll just point out that in the new, um, the Nomad B4, um, there are eight examples of individuals with um, XY genotypes whose only copy of dystrophin is missing um, multiple exons. Um, so I mentioned earlier that delivery is a challenge here, and there are multiple companies that have novel chemistries or delivery strategies that are in trials, um, but all of these are focused on the four most common exons. And I'll just point out that the largest group here, 30% of individuals, have exon-skippable mutations that are too rare to be commercially viable. I also want to add that this is not because these companies are evil. This is a regulatory challenge. So there's no mechanism to have a basket trial where you bring in kids with different dystrophin mutations and give them um, an antisense oligo that targets their particular exon. Um, and so really inspired by Tim and Winston and others, um, we've started to think about using the N of 1 pathway to target these ultra-rare mutations. And again, I want to be clear that what we're trying to do here is a lot like what Winston so beautifully described, which is extend existing pipelines into the ultra-rare space. Um, and so how we've imagined doing this is we've started by identifying a candidate ultra-rare exon that has been shown in multiple contexts to be skippable. Um, we borrow from established protocols for more common mutations um, to screen for target sequence. We are still thinking about and working towards um, how we build evidence for the efficacy of the dystrophin light that will be produced. And finally, and this is a key challenge of these muscle disorders, we need a delivery strategy. And so we are still left with needing to license um, a delivery strategy to muscle. And I'll just point out that from my perspective, while the science isn't trivial, this is the easy part. And really, the logistical and the licensing challenges are the hard part. Um, and so, so I hope what I've been able to communicate is that we need to not just look at the mountain, but find ways to bring everyone there with us. Um, and I'll again emphasize that we are embarking on this journey and really excited to find folks who want to work with us in any capacity. Um, and with that, I'll just thank um, some collaborators, some people who have given us really wonderful advice, and, and again, thank all of you for being here. Michelle, nice talk. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about the um, oh the cross cross domain collaborative working group to try to reduce immunogenicity in AAV? Because that's kind of a holy grail for 
all this sorts is, of reasons. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, so this group is sort of my dream. Um, um, but, you know, I think there's a huge topic of AAV immunogenicity, right? And so we could talk about capsid responses, and we can divide that into many categories. We could talk about transgene responses. Um, and I think there are going to be things that are disease specific, and whether that's because of the tissue you're targeting or because of the features of the disease, we're going to find disease specific strategies. Um, but, you know, I'll just say what strikes me is when I talk to my friends who do solid organ transplant and I say, how would you suppress the immune system to allow someone to get a virus that we think is transduced in hours um, and is probably cleared within weeks, like every one of them gives me a combination strategy. So people have ideas um, and I think it just feels like um, it's sort of you need people who are comfortable building and giving those drugs to be in the space as we sort of bring these to patients and sort of in the space of developing that strategy. And so it feels to me like everyone agrees this is an issue. Everyone has an idea of how to solve it, um, but not all of those people are talking to each other. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, so I think... Uh, on some level, it's got to be everyone. I think there's a real appeal, actually, to housing this in academia, um, although sponsors have to be, like industry has to be at the table because they're the ones running the trial. Um, but I, I do think there are um, ways in which um, you're a little more free. And you know, if we're talking about a combination therapy of three drugs coming from two companies, it's actually a little easier to house those strategies, I think, in academia than purely in industry. But I, industry has to be at the table. It, it's not going to do anything otherwise. for sharing that. Um, I am excited to introduce Dr. Natalie Gallant, who is the CEO and co-founder of Paradox Immunotherapeutics, a pharmaceutical, com pharmaceutical company dedicated to the creation of antibody therapies for the treatment of rare protein misfolding diseases. She is also a 2023 Tremere Fellow. Natalie received her PhD from the University of Toronto's Department of Medical Biophysics, where her PhD work helped lead to the development of a mono monoclonal antibody currently in FDA clinical trials for the treatment of cardiac disease. Uh, welcome, Natalie. No worries. Thank you so much. Um, so I was gonna get things started. Okay, perfect, hold on, I'm going back. All right, hold on. Okay, yeah, so thank you again. My name is Natalie Gallant. I am the CEO and co-founder of Paradox Immunotherapeutics. Thank you again to the organizers for inviting me to speak here today on basically Niche to Nuco, Lessons and Pearls for Building a Rare Disease Biotech. So before we get started today, I'd like to do a quick poll of the audience just so I know who's in the room. So put your hands up if we have any academics in the audience. Postdocs, PIs, okay, awesome, even undergrads. <laughs> um, how about clinicians? Hands up, clinicians, fantastic. How about any patient advocacy groups or members of the patient community? Amazing, amazing. And then how about any folks currently in biotech? Yes, yes, we're all here. And how about investors, the people with the cash? <laughs> All right, and as well as the most important, any aspiring entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs? Amazing. So before I get into it, um, basically when I was invited here to speak today, I was just like, okay, what am I going to speak about? I'm going to talk about the company a little bit, do I show data? And I was like, you know what? I think the biggest way that could have impact speaking to this group and this audience is basically, you know, having a talk about things that I wish I knew before I entered the rare disease space and the biotech space. And so basically my story started off with the following. So as described earlier is that by Catherine that I did my PhD in medical biophysics at the University of Toronto. 
And in essence, the focus of my academic research was developing an antibody or an immunotherapy towards uh, a protein called transthyretin. Transthyretin, TTR, has anybody heard of it? Put your hands up. Yeah. Back in 2013, when I started my graduate studies and I was talking about it, nobody had any idea what the heck that disease was. Now, a lot of folks know about it. And so developed an antibody that recognized the misfolded forms of this protein. And when TTR misfolds, it results in heart failure. It accumulates in the heart. And so what happened was we developed this antibody. And then there was a pharmaceutical company in South San Francisco. They then had an interest in it, and they in-licensed it. So basically, they did a sponsored research agreement with the academic lab, and I was working together with their scientists towards developing that antibody and developing the data package surrounding it. So then what happened at that point is 2018, I graduated, and disclaimer, I have nothing to do with this antibody anymore. And this pharmaceutical company took that antibody into patients to do phase one clinical trials. And what happened was is in 2020, they reported positive phase one data. It was safe and well tolerated in all patients, and it improved cardiac systolic function. It improved heart function in patients which was a big deal at the time, because it was the first time that an amyloid depleting antibody was shown to have effect in systemic amyloidosis. And then what happened was, in essence, another large pharma came in and acquired it from that pharma in a large financial transaction. So that whole experience really lit the fire for us in terms of, OK, we learned from that experience. Let's rinse and repeat, and let's do this again. So we picked another disease, it's also a rare disease, and it's called immunoglobulin light chain amyloidosis. AL amyloidosis, it causes heart failure as well. And that's, in essence, where Paradox started. Um, we are a biotech that develops immunotherapies for a wide range of protein misfolding diseases. And in essence, right now, we have three drugs in development and a platform to back it up. And the thing is, there's a ton of antibody companies out there. A lot of immunotherapy companies, we totally acknowledge that. But the challenge in the protein misfolding space is developing therapeutics that can distinguish between the healthy versus pathological forms of the protein. Many companies struggle with this. However, it's what we at Paradox do best. And as I described earlier, we had a successful history with our scientific team developing misfolding specific antibodies, one of which was from TTR, and we did have a history in working in ALS. So right now, we currently have a couple of programs. We have a big pharma partnership. And what we essentially do for protein misfolding, and I think Anna at the, the virtual talk was a good description of, of protein misfolding. But you have proteins in your body and your circulation. These proteins in various diseases, they can misfold. They can change shape, and they can aggregate into structures, potentially called amyloid, that can deposit in various organs in your body, causing organ dysfunction and potentially even death. So, our solution to this problem is that we have a platform that allows us to design specialized immunotherapies or antibodies that specifically only target those bad proteins that cause problems, but leave the healthy proteins in your body completely untouched. And by tagging these bad proteins, you're able to recruit cells from the body's own immune system, harness the power of your immune system to clear these deposits from organs and restore organ function. So we've done this for a number of proteins in the past. And currently at Paradox, we developed specialized antibodies for AL amyloidosis, which results in heart, kidney, and liver failure, which we have a big pharma partnership with in terms of accelerated development. We've also developed this for another disease called ALEC2 amyloidosis. This is actually a rare disease, highly underdiagnosed, especially in non-white Caucasian populations, and especially affecting Hispanic American populations. That causes kidney failure. And we do have a neuro program, which is also undisclosed, um, which we disclose under CDA. <laughs> uh, but in essence, that's what we do. Um, we are fundraising, if anybody is interested in learning more. But with that, I'm going to change gears and focus on what I want to talk today, um, which is about things that I wish I knew before I started this journey. And I've learned a lot. And once again, the things that I will share today have been from our own personal experience in developing a rare disease biotech. And I will share some stories as well as from other entrepreneurs who've shared um, from their own experience in going to the rare disease space. But if anything, the only thing I will ask everybody in the audience today is the main takeaway from this talk, if it's nothing you remember anything else, please remember that the most important group to remember in this experience is the patients. They are central to your, the success of your company. And it's important to remember that. And I mean, 
I spoke with actually someone last week, and they were former Genzyme, and I said I was giving this talk, and he said, he goes, make sure you emphasize to everybody in the room that they have to talk to patients. <laughs> and literally, you need to keep in contact, you need to work with them from the very beginning up until the very end when eventually you do enter clinic. So please, if that's the one takeaway, please remember that patients are at the center. So my pearl of wisdom, number one, Something that I learned is as I go on, going on from what we just spoke about, connecting with the patient community. All right, yeah, that's, okay, we get it, that's important, yes. But doing it early. I'm talking about at the very beginning. So often, as I know we got a lot, a lot of academics in the room, and even clinicians, are just a, different, a wide range of people, but we're very comfortable in our labs. We're very comfortable in our office spaces and everything like that. We don't like venture beyond. To talk to patients, no, that's, no, we'll read the literature, we'll understand the problem from that. We don't need to actually talk to people. No, get out of the lab, get out of your office, and go talk to patients. So what we actually did, we were a bunch of postdocs at the time, and um, with a very, some, some basically very, not shy, but cons conserved uh, postdocs, and we actually went Saturday afternoons to the patient support meetings, the patient support groups, and we interviewed patients. We sat down with them and we asked them, we were just like, what do you experience? And this is very important because you really need to understand the problem. And with that, we asked them, we were like, okay, tell us, what are your, what are your challenges? What happens? What is it like to live with your indication? And I'm talking about like your daily activities of life and everything like that. Tell us, help us understand more. And you learn that patient story because that patient story is gonna be critical down the road when you are talking to funders, when you're talking to investors. They need to understand what the patients are going through. Another important thing, you need to ask patients about their road to diagnosis, um, especially for a rare disease. When we talked to patients, they told us, listen, I have a rare disease. Do you know how long it took me to get to the right clinician who actually knew what I was talking about? I spent three to four years telling different family physicians, going to walk-in clinics, even going to the eMERGE saying, I have this problem, but it's been a long time problem. It's not an emergency, go home. So the problem is, is that, and this, the reason why this is important is because eventually investors are gonna ask you, patient enrollment, how are you gonna find these patients? And if you ask, well, what's the patient experience? We got that often all the time. If you don't say, if you say, I don't know, that doesn't really look good on you. The next thing, unmet need. Is there actually an unmet need? That's, it's, it, that's a critical, or do you just think there's an unmet need? Often academics and folks, we think that, yeah, there's a problem, but is there? And uh, are you solving the right problem that these patients are going um, through? Are you bringing a hammer to a nail, or are you bringing a hammer to a screw? And with that, you also need to understand the current standard of care. And uh, someone recently shared with me a couple of nights ago, and he worked with a rare disease biotech, and he goes, we talk to people and they're like, oh, well, what we have is good enough. Well, you don't wanna be just competing with good enough. You wanna have a substantial impact in the life of the patients that you're working with. And finally, and also important, is that the patients, they're, the, they're on your team. You guys are on the same team. You're all working towards the same common mission and goal of creating a treatment to transform the lives of the patients that you're working with. And they also have con uh, connections to KOLs as well as foundations, which can be potentially helpful. The next thing, talking to KOLs or key opinion leaders. Often these folks are clinicians, and it's important to speak with clinicians. And the reason why it's important is that the rare disease community is small, but so is the clinician community that's working on these rare indications. So you need to get in there ASAP, and you need to start developing relationships and also building trust from the get-go. And I was speaking with someone actually a couple days ago who also had a rare disease biotech, and I said, what was your experience? And he goes, you know what? He goes, we had a great therapy. The problem is the patients didn't want to enroll in our studies. Why? They thought we were, and this is his language, we thought, they thought we were crooks. He goes, he goes, nobody knew us. He goes, we were working so diligently on this therapy, and then eventually they were like, oh, you guys are pharma, you guys, you guys just want to make money off of us. So the point is, is that get into that small community, start building trust and establishing those relationships early. They will be fruitful. Another thing that it's important in talking to clinicians with is tapping into their network to access patient samples and clinical samples, especially for preclinical development. And I know it sounds trivial, clinical samples, they're easy to get. No, 
They're not, because uh, I'll give you an example to help to provide context. So for instance, we work with AL amyloidosis, and um, we were talking, and the, golden, the gold standard for diagnosis is often biopsy, so they biopsy patients. And we were talking to a pathologist, and we said, we're just like, listen, we need patient samples. And he goes, do you know how many patients come in to my clinic every single day? I don't know who has a rare disease. I'm not gonna consent to every single person for your study so you can get clinical samples. What we do typically do is once we find out they have a rare disease, we we'll sometimes have a little bit of biopsy tissue left, and we can approach them, ask if we can archive it. But you are competing with other collaborators, other academics, other biotechs who also want access to that tissue. So all I'm trying to say here is, Tap into that clinician community and find out who has samples because you're gonna have to really reach far and wide. Another thing, obviously, I think it's, I think it's obvious is that, um, but maybe it's not, is that connecting with clinicians to find those clinical champions. One person shared with me, yeah, it's important to find clinical champions, but also clinical champions who align with the modality that you wanna bring as your solution. So it's important to find those folks and also because they will help you with your, your clinical trial design, especially in designing appropriate clinical endpoints for that indication that you're going after. And also, helping you in terms of patient recruitment and patient enrollment, which is gonna be key when you're talking to investors because I'll talk about later, is that that's often one of their biggest concerns. And another thing is that sometimes you might have to, or you might wanna bring, you can actually sometimes bring patient groups or patient advocacy groups, but also your clinical KOLs to diligence meetings with investors. And I will caveat this and say that there's different groups that you will meet, and I had some conversations with folks about this earlier this week especially, in terms of you'll be speaking with angel groups, you'll be speaking with family offices versus VC. Um, Bringing, just all I want to say here is know your audience, especially if you're talking to venture capital, understand what their mandate is. I think it's valuable to bring some of these folks to meetings to help them understand, understand what the patients are going through and understand what's really driving the mission of the company and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and then that ties into investors. In essence, uh, painting the picture for investors. That's a big big piece of advice that I have for you today. Because often what you get is you'll talk to a bunch of investors and the immediate response is, we don't do rare disease. No, 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 no. we don't do rare disease. Or you'll pitch to them and they'll be like, ah, we don't do it because it's their, the, we just don't do rare disease. Well, dive into that just a little bit further. Why don't you do rare disease? And often the answer is because it doesn't line up in terms of their clinical development with venture timelines. Venture often has a strict timeline in which they need to create returns for their LPs. And sometimes, the problem with rare diseases, this is going back to earlier, is patient recruitment and patient enrollment. This will extend this time span of that early phase 1B, phase 1A or phase 1B clinical trial. And the other thing is, is that I was speaking to someone else in venture recently, and uh, this actually can go for rare disease and also prevalent diseases, but talking about your plan forward. For rare disease, this is critical because you need to show investors that we know where to, we know where to find the patients, we know how to enroll them, and these will be the FDA, appro FDA, appro FDA approved clinical endpoints that we'll use for our studies. And uh, just sharing this, one person said to me, she goes, you know what? She goes, companies always come and they pitch to me, and the problem is they're telling us all the stuff we did in, they did in the past, but we don't really care about that. I'm financing your path forward and whether you can achieve what you want to do. And with rare disease, it's a little bit more challenging because of the patients, finding those patients. So it's important to emphasize, when you first meet them, say, listen, this is what we've done, but this is our plan forward, especially because we're working with an orphan indication. All right, pearl of wisdom, number four, thinking outside the box. If you can, if you can tie your disease to more prevalent indications, that will be helpful because the first thing investors are gonna ask about is, it's unfortunate, but they will ask about your market opportunity. So um, what I can say here is that, um, for instance, the disease that we focus on, AL amyloidosis, um, the underlying plasma cell dyscrasia is also be, can also be connected to multiple myeloma. So 15 to 20% of multiple myeloma patients can also have this disease. Sometimes that's helpful to share with investors, and if you can do it, that's great, but if not, 
Um, there's another thing that I do want to share is that if you have the luxury, if you're in a current biotech or you have science or a platform that can apply to be a wide variety of protein misfolding diseases, for instance, our current platform, there's over 30 diseases um, caused by protein misfolding. So we can selectively choose which ones we have to go after. And so the idea of balancing ultra rare diseases versus rare enough that escapes pricing constraints is one piece of advice that I would just like to share with folks today. And pearl of wisdom and the final one is number five. We have not been able to do this. However, I do know of some select companies that have, is basically developing a blockbuster therapeutic in parallel. So basically getting investment to fund that lead program that, ha that is a prevalent disease, but also having, you can have NIH funding or what federal funding, non-dilutive funding, to keep your rare disease program just keep it going to the point where you can fund it to get to volume inflection point milestones to, so that you can accelerate it from that to take it off. We don't have the ability to do that. We don't have any blockbuster therapeutics, but I do know of one or two companies that have been able to do this. So in essence, I hope that was helpful. These are things that I have learned as well as others have shared with me when they've developed their uh, rare disease biotechs. And if you have any other questions or you do want to get in touch, my email, Let's Talk Science at Paradox Amino, is on the screen. And thank you again for the community getting together today, um, where I hope that we can all work together so that every patient has a cure. Thank you so much, and happy to take any questions. Natalie, maybe for our academic audience, at what point when you were in the lab did you decide, we have something here, this needs to be a company? How did you de-risk the science? And what was the catalyst for you saying, OK, it's time to form a company around this idea? Um, hmm. I think, I'll be honest, is that we really wanted to develop a diagnostic for transthyrene amyloidosis. And the technology was out-licensed, and there was restrictions of what we could do after the fact. And so we said, all right, you know what? We have something really golden here. We have a platform that allows us to develop you know, antibodies towards misfolded proteins. TTR, at that point, people were getting excited about it. And we said, well, let's pick a disease that's also similar, has a similar mechanism of action, but how about that's more prevalent in TTR? And that's how really we're like, with bigger market, we actually could have gone after, we were thinking about ALS, because that was our history in, uh, in the lab. Um, but then folks started giving us, in terms of early venture investors, like, well, how are you going to cost the broadband barrier? And we were like, you know, that's not something, like, we can, we don't want to be destroyed at the, at the very beginning because of that. So we were like, OK, so let's pick another disease. And we picked AL amyloidosis. But really, that was the spark that let everything go. Um, forward. Wonderful insights. I think that tracks perfectly with uh, my experience as well. One thing um, I want to ask you is rare, rare knows no borders, right? So the international dynamics and uh, just recruitment and advocacy on that rare disease. Can you speak to that? What do you mean in terms of? I guess it's like finding patients. So like LEC2 amyloidosis, sometimes yes. like in Mexico, it's more of a prevalent population. Like, and working with regulatory, I, again, if, if you've had those experiences, I'd love to pick your brain on it. Yeah, um, we've reached wide and far. We normally have stuck to North America in terms mm -hmm. of even like finding patient samples or even patient groups. Um, it's, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible, at least for the beginning, um, and picking a jurisdiction or a territory where we can basically find the most, where, wherever the patients are, that's where you need to focus. Yeah. For instance, if there's a genetic, basis to it and whatnot, and there's a lot, for instance, TTR, there's a, there's a concentration of patients, in, for instance, in Portugal. That's where we need to go, that's where we need to go. Some instances, AL amyloidosis has no hereditary um, background or anything like that, so we have to look far and wide. So yes, rare has no border, um, and so you just need to go where the patients are. And the samples. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Natalie. 
um, one of the things that we love about this collaboration is the sheer variety of people working in this space, which is, as everyone is, is saying, so critical to impacting patients. And our next speaker is going to transcend time and space with his discussion for us. So um, Jim Garrity is an industry leader who has worked on orphan drugs for more than 40 years as a strategy consultant, a CEO, a leader of pioneering international operations at Genzyme, and a venture entrepreneur. He is a Georgetown graduate with a master's in psychology from Penn and a law degree from Yale. He is a citizen of three countries. I'm not sure how you, that, that seems like the biggest <laughs> actually accomplishment of them all. And he, and he lives in Boston. Um, recently, Jim authored Inside the Orphan Drug Revolution. I think a couple of our speakers have mentioned that. And so he's going to tell us uh, more about the history, including eyewitness accounts of this movement that started in the 1980s and transform the prospects of patients with rare disease. So welcome, Jim. Thank you, Catherine. I think that was a gracious way of saying I'm a lot older than the other speakers. But uh, <laughs> it's great to see so many of you here today and truly great to see so many people in the next generation taking up this cause in such inspiring ways. Uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you today. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about history. I'm going to talk at the end a little bit about some aspects of the, the revolution that remain unfilled, a little bit at the other end of the spectrum from what other people have spoken about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about drugs that have been developed, that have had many years of research and development put into them, in many cases tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, promising clinical data, and are still stuck. And we need to figure out how to move those forward. But before I come to those, let me go back and, and tell you a little bit of the history by maybe telling you a story to start with. And I'm going to start with the story of a woman named Abby Myers. And uh, we've had some shows of hands. I'll take a show of hands. How many of you have ever heard of Abby Myers? Well, she's somebody you should know about. And actually, I, I didn't bring any slides today, but I brought some books for show and tell. Uh, so I wrote a book that Catherine mentioned. And the story of Abby Myers starts my book, because Abby Myers started the orphan drug revolution. And Abby was, as she would always describe herself, an ordinary mother. She wasn't a scientist. She wasn't a physician. She wasn't an executive. She was what she would have been called in those years a housewife. And she had a son named David. And David, at birth, seemed healthy and normal and was growing up for a few years and then started to develop a condition, some behaviors and things, that dis a disorder. It was very hard to understand. And as many people have talked about here today, the diagnostic odyssey took many years to determine what it was. It turned out to be Tourette syndrome. And Abby was, like many mothers in these situations, passionate and dedicated to helping her son, you know, scoured the world, found the world's leading expert in Tourette's syndrome in New York, brought her son David there. And he was, he, she was very pleased and relieved to find that this physician had a drug that was working. He treated other Tourette's patients with it. And David was put on it. And David responded well. But then it turned out that the company that was developing that drug actually was developing it for one of these much more prevalent indications and they were running a very large clinical trial. That trial failed. And when that trial failed, the company made the conclusion that financially it was not viable to maintain all of the infrastructure, manufacturing, and pharmacovigilance, and regulatory filings for, this, for, for the Tourette's patients. And so they pulled the product from the market. And David and many of the other children that Abby had come to know with Tourette's syndrome immediately deteriorated and had no effective therapy. Abby obviously was outraged by this. And like many mothers, she looked to see what could she do. And at the time, there wasn't much to do. So she got together with other parents, other family members from many other diseases. It was a broad-based continuum, very rare patients at that time. The orphan drug community was, patient communities were not at all well organized. Abby put together what became the foundation of what is today NORD, the National Organization of Rare Diseases, of which she was basically the founder and the first president. But with that kind of ragtag group of, of friends and fellow parents and family members, she went to Congress. And what was considered an impossible task persuaded one congressman, Henry Waxman from California, who had a constituent who was also a part of this group, who had a child with a, sim a similar rare disease, to take on the cause of trying to advocate for legislation to, to try to fix this problem. And first, they tried to find a way to force companies to produce these drugs. And that proved unviable. Then they thought about incentives. And slowly, after a couple of years, support came together from across many sectors, championed by patients, championed by the story I tell in the book, an outpouring of over 50,000 letters that came from one television show 
from somebody who'd gotten to know Abby featuring Tourette syndrome on their show and the lack of a therapy. And it was that public outpouring of support that led to the passage of the Orphan Drug Act. That was almost exactly 40 years ago, 1983. And that was the first spark that lit the revolution because that provided certain incentives, certain opportunities to interact with the FDA, certain tax benefits, certain market exclusivity that was very important to investors and entrepreneurs thinking about trying to take on those drugs. But there were still no drugs available. And, and most people still felt at that point that these rare diseases were unviable and that no company could be successful. Pharma at that time, big pharma, was then, as it is today in many ways, in the thrall of what are called blockbusters. And the first billion dollar drugs were just being developed. And the, 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 the formula for a blockbuster that pharma found was most attractive in those years was if you found a drug that worked and it became a billion dollar drug, if you could tweak it just a little bit and make it just a little better, you could get a new patent, that could become the standard of care, and you could have the multi-billion dollar drug. A classic example of this was statins, where there have been, I think, now seven generations of statins, each one very marginal improvement over the one before, but each one providing, in the case of Lipitor, made probably the largest, 10 to $12 billion in annual sales. So pharma flocked to those blockbusters, those Me Too drugs, safe, very profitable, millions of patients. But there was one guy, Henry Tamir, subject to the other book, the other part of my show and tell. If you haven't seen this book, I encourage you to take a look at it by John Hawkins, Biography of Henry. And it tells the story of, of how Henry, Conscience and Courage is the title of the book. And that was really, I think, the reason that's the title of the book is that's what it took to start the company. It took a belief that as an industry, as pharmaceutical executives, we had a responsibility to these patients, meeting these patients, as people talked about, and seeing their condition and their families that we had the ability to develop drugs, we had to meet the responsibility to try to take on a way to develop those, along with, obviously, the physician scientists who were developing these drugs. Genzum was based largely on the work of one physician scientist at the NIH, Roscoe Brady, who was researching a novel, uh, a very little known disease at the time, called Gaucher disease, a novel strategy using an enzyme called glucocerebrosidase. And Genzym was basically founded on the production and ultimately the marketing, the development and the marketing of a therapy, glucose rebrosidase for Gaucher disease, or ceridase and cerazyme. But When Henry was starting Genzyme, many people, including me, because I was working with him in a different capacity then, told him he was crazy. It would never work. There were too few patients. And you did the math, there were so few Gaucher patients, which of course were then, as was also said earlier, widely underdiagnosed, you could never make the math work in terms of what people thought society would pay to provide these therapies. And the question Henry asked was, do we want these patients treated? Do we want these children, in most cases, treated? If we do, and if we explain to society why the drugs will cost so much, because number one, the diseases are so rare, and number two, the costs and risks of drug development are so high, then the question is, will people want these children cared for? If they don't, then the company won't be successful. If they do, then they'll provide reimbursement and access, and we'll be able to supply the drug sustainably. It turned out they did. And that became the second spark that really lit the orphan drug revolution and led to what today has been, over those 40 years, a radical transformation. And there are, as many of you know, hundreds of approved therapies for orphan drugs. There are hundreds and hundreds more in research and, and development and clinical trials today. Uh, and there are thousands, there are probably millions in total of patients around the world, because this has been a global revolution as we just talked about, these genetic diseases in general know no regional or national limits. And millions of patients around the world benefiting from all of the work and the courage and the, and the, and the effort that people put into that. But I would say that with all that having been done, the orphan drug revolution is still in its infancy, even after 40 years. I was talking with someone earlier, and it's a, like many revolutions, you know, it's probably 100 years before the fruits of the revolution will bear out. Many of the things that we're talking about here today, N of 1 collaborations and other ultra-rare diseases, there's much scientific work to be done and much work, policy and otherwise, to be done to provide a path to getting those to be successful therapies. But at the other end of that spectrum, there is another problem looking ahead that I'm more focused on. And I'm, my role today, I'm not a scientist or a physician. I've been involved in a number of biotech companies. Since Genzyme, I've been an investor and an entrepreneur, and I serve today on the boards of four or five companies, most of which are developing therapies for these ultra-orphan diseases. And I've been involved in situations where, tragically, companies have had to do the thing that we always hoped we'd never have to do, which is to stop work 
on a drug that has very promising clinical data. And some of the companies that I've been involved with have been pilloried in the media for having abandoned patients, for having given up a drug because it didn't make economic sense. And we did, in a sense, do that. And we did it because we reluctantly came to believe that the survival of the company was at stake and that the other therapies that we were working to develop would all fail. The entire company would fail if we weren't able to focus and prioritize and, and pool the limited resources that were available in this very difficult investment climate on the therapies that had the greatest investor interest and would allow us to sustain the company and hopefully maybe come back to some of those therapies at some point. So the question is, what do we do about those diseases and those programs today? And what we're finding is there are dozens, if not hundreds, of programs with promising clinical trials that have shown data that, that are arguably the basis for regulatory approval. But that's a very long and arduous process. And the FDA, which at the leadership level speaks very supportively of being flexible and accelerating reviews, when you get into the staff review levels, you, know, you get a certain kind of box checking mentality that raises the bar very high to a point where it becomes unviable for many of these companies to continue to work, to go back for yet another clinical trial, to ultimately receive approval to bring the therapy to market. So what is it that can be done about that? There are some of us working on ideas. Craig Martin, is Craig, uh, Craig is here. Where's Craig? Right there, Craig. Craig has been the sponsor of an idea that he's inspired me with, and I've talked to some other people here about. That's one example, I think, of something that, um, that I see and that many of us see as a kind of a promising approach here. And it builds on what many people here and many people in this community have done in individual patient organizations. And if you look at, at the history of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which was discussed, or cystic fibrosis, or many of the other diseases where therapies have been successfully developed and brought to market, they were often started and funded significantly along the way by patients by patient families and patient organizations and the, their philanthropy and the fundraising that they did. And that's still today a way that some of these drugs may be brought forward. But I think there, to, to address this problem broadly, we need a more systematic approach. We need a broader approach that's not just disease specific, but that tries to put together a framework to say, how can we organize these drugs in a way that we can have a viable, sustainable engine of final drug development and approval for these promising compounds. And then, if that works, maybe even earlier stage compounds for ultra-orphan drugs. So what's that going to take? Like, like many of the things that have gone before us in this field, it's going to take a multi-stakeholder consortium kind of approach. It's going to take private industry. It's going to take companies contributing assets and, and capabilities. But it's also going to take, it's, it's going to be probably a nonprofit venture, right? Because if these drugs had a viable financial opportunity, Pharma and biotech and venture investors wouldn't be giving up on them. So almost by definition, they can't be brought to market on a purely financial calculation, on a classical venture capital, biotech, biopharma model. They need to be brought forward on a model that combines those capabilities with some combination of pure philanthropy. Some people who see this as a mission, where they see a mission which is not just around an individual disease, which is a very powerful and inspiring mission, but a mission around addressing this problem in the system, the economic and socioeconomic, health economic system, and want to take that on in a, in a larger way. Uh, and it takes universities. Many of these programs, you know, and I've been involved in a number of these discussions, academic investigators and universities have done work for years, put millions of dollars of work by some of their best investigators into these trials. And they've seen that they're working. And then they've licensed them to pharma companies or biotech companies. And now they've gotten them back. And now what do they do? Because they can't take drugs through FDA approval. As brilliant as the work that they're doing is, that's a different kind of process. The regulatory mindset and capabilities are radically different from the academic mindset and capabilities. It's all about systematization and you know, following the rules, as opposed to just uh, innovating and, and, and finding solutions. So, but those, those institutions have to be participants. They can and do fund many of these trials. They can de-risk as they say, many of these programs by taking them further. So the question is, how do we do it? It's early on in its thinking, and it's a little bit at the other end of the spectrum, maybe from what many people in this room are thinking about. But I think it's important for you to have in mind and recognize as you go forward, even when you get successful data, even successful clinical data, you know, getting over the finish line you know, has yet another set of hurdles that we together need to find ways to solve. So there's no easy solution. 
But uh, I would say in closing, you know, just as 40 years ago, what people told uh, Abby Myers was crazy and could never happen, and what people told Henry Tamir was crazy and could never happen, is what, what many of you are, are told. And one, you know, treatments are crazy and can never happen, and finding ways to treat these other very rare diseases are crazy and can never happen, and treating immune reactions in, you know, in, in gene therapy is crazy and can never happen. But they do happen. And they take time, they take a sustained effort. One of Henry's many favorite sayings that we all you know, heard and, and cherished for many years was, what we do is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, we're not in this for the short term, and anybody who's in it for the short term is gonna be disappointed because we're not gonna solve these problems or achieve these goals in the short term. It's a lifetime of work, but it's a lifetime of work which is, has incredible rewards, and I'm inspired to see so many people taking it up in so many new ways today, and I hope that you'll all build on the shoulders of these pioneers who've gone before and take these, these, these therapies, these developments in this community to the next level. And I, I look forward to watching and to, to being part of it. So thank you all very much and happy to take questions and have a discussion. If there are any. If everybody wants to take a break, that's fine too. Yeah, Jim, thanks. You talked about the Orphan Drug Act and, and its um, financial and regulatory and other incentives to spark the rare disease industry. What's the next Orphan Disease Act, and if it isn't wending its way through legislation, what should it be? That's a very good question, Nan. And we do need the policy environment was you know, instrumental in addressing orphan diseases, and we need a revised policy environment to address ultra-orphan diseases. I think as an industry, you know, we need to be responsible about this. And as you, most of you know, the threshold for an orphan disease in the United States is 200,000 people, and it's a comparable number in Europe. Today, as an industry, I think we ought to be prepared to accept a lower number, actually, for extending that, because if there's a disease that has 100,000 or even 50,000 patients, there's no biotech or pharma company who would hesitate to undertake it today. In return, what we need are greater incentives for ultra-orphan indications, greater market exclusivity, greater tax benefits, greater regulatory, greater regulatory flexibility is very high on the list. There is some legislation that's being proposed by a, couple of, by a nonpartisan coalition there are some groups, like uh, the group that uh, Emil Kakis founded, the um, um, Every, Life. Every Life Foundation, thank you, that has drafted that legislation and that is, has submitted it to Congress. So yes, there is a need for modifying the legislation. There are other elements of it, the, um, the patient, uh, the priority review voucher, which is a very important, very important measure in this field. That's, that's a very powerful tool. But as many of you know, that has a sunset provision. It expires every two to four years. It should be made permanent. It certainly needs to be renewed when it expires next, but ideally it would be made permanent because people are making decisions that are five, six, eight years away, and you can't make those based on an incentive that expires in two years. The last thing I'd say, which is also a little bit underappreciated, but very critical because so many of these ultra-orphan indications obviously strike at birth, and, and the, the onset of severe disease progression is so rapid that newborn screening is essential to identifying patients early and being able to treat when a therapy can really have its maximum impact. And the newborn screening legislation, which some of you probably know much better than I do, is antiquated in the United States. There's still a very outdated kind of, I would say, a patriarchal mindset that parents don't want to know if their child has a disease unless there's a therapy. That might have been the case, I don't know, in, an earlier, in earlier generations. But today, patient, parents do want to know because they want to know if they can get their child in a trial. And so newborn screening policies, which prevent new diseases from going on the newborn screening panel for years after this promising clinical data, also need to be addressed as part of getting patients treated. Hello. So uh, I have two questions. Uh, first goes like, uh, what are the major challenges you think that uh, when it comes to clinical trials with the orphan drugs, uh, and like the patients who uh, who you are, I mean, conducting the clinical trials for the orphan drugs. What do you think the main uh, like challenges you faced uh, in a clinical trial, like designing that or something like that? Yeah, well, so one of the major problems is simply having enough patients to do a controlled, randomized, you know, trial. Uh, and again, many of the orphan drugs diseases for which drugs have been developed. There were a few thousand patients, Gaucher disease, for example, when, when we started with that. And 30 years ago, people thought you could never develop a therapy for a disease with a few thousand patients. 
if there are a few thousand patients with a disease, you probably can do a relatively classical controlled clinical trial with statistical significance. But if there's a disease with dozens of patients, that becomes impossible. And so we need to find different approaches to clinical trials. We need to find, we need to use, make much greater use of natural histories, of learning, of learning from registries and historical patient data to allow us to determine that an intervention is successful without having to have a randomized placebo control trial. A second, a second important consideration, which was mentioned earlier, is defining endpoints. You know, what exactly is the approvable endpoint in a complex trial? We need more flexibility around composite endpoints and around assessing endpoints that are important to patients, even if they don't meet certain classical endpoint criteria. Um, thank you. And also, I would like to know, like, how do you think uh, regulatory agencies can support the development of orphan drugs? Say it one more time. How do you think regulatory agencies can support the development of orphan drugs? Regulatory, how can regulatory agencies support development? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing the regulatory agencies can do is to provide appropriate regulatory flexibility. And again, if you talk, if you listen to what the senior leadership of the FDA or the EMA says, that's exactly what they say they intend to do. But when drugs are actually submitted for approval, that's not what's applied in practice. And so we have this mechanism of accelerated approval, right? And we need to make much greater, and Peter Marks just spoke about that, I think, yesterday. Um, we need to make much greater use of accelerated approval. But the, the industry also needs to take up its responsibility on accelerated approval, which is a post-approval commitment. And we need to make much greater use of approving drugs based on biomarkers, even if we haven't shown definitive proof of clinical efficacy. And then, but then we have to follow up with real world studies and demonstrate that there is clinical efficacy or have the drug withdrawn from the market. Uh, thank you. And I have a curiosity as uh, she introduced about yourself. Like, it's apart from this. How do you got to the citizenship of three? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that story during the break. That's a okay. personal family story, but a good one. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> in the FDA um, and that she failed and that she was very frustrated about that. And, and the goal was really to help rare diseases um, go through the regulatory framework in a much more flexible way. But do you know anything about that? I'm going to see if I can call an expert consultant to answer that question. Rich Wyshynski worked closely with Janet in the FDA and was a close friend of Genzyme for many years. Rich, would you be willing to comment on that? Yeah, it's a complicated story. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, power at the FDA was concentrated in the centers. The idea of creating a, um, you know, at first there was this idea that we would have this, uh, not just a separate office, but an actual, like we have for oncology, um, a broader based uh, area for rare diseases that would bring together uh, the ability to address um, different biologics, as well as small molecules, um, and even uh, devices potentially, in one center that could address this as a whole. But that wasn't politically viable within the FDA, and uh, could, not really, could not really happen, and Janet couldn't really support it. Uh, so next was the idea of creating the Office of Rare Diseases, because it was also clear that um, while we had a division that addressed many of the rare diseases, and there is a division for rare diseases now um, uh, at the FDA, uh, but you know the, the expertise necessary to really address the details medically uh, of these were spread across the entire center, right? So you have neurologic expertise in the Office for Neurologic Disorders, you have uh, expertise uh, for, um, you know, other metabolic disorders in another uh, division. You have expertise for gastrointestinal in another, and on and on it goes. So uh, while there is a division for rare diseases, and while they do address things, um, things still get parceled out. And it's true that uh, each division and each office 
um, looks at these in their own way still today. Uh, I don't think the story is over to create an office of rare diseases that has a broader power. I think that's still potentially possible. Um, the first speaker of the next session is Caitlin Samoha. She's an assistant professor at Massachusetts General Hospital and an associated scientist here at the Broad Institute. She's on the steering committee for the genome aggregation database that we affectionately call NOMAD, um, which is one of the world's largest publicly available collections of human genetic variation data. The focus of her research career has been on developing methods and statistical tools to improve interpretation of genetic variation, particularly rare variation, which she's going to tell us about today. Um, a little bit more about Caitlin. She actually created a mutational model to predict the expected number of newly arising or de novo variants that have been leveraged to associate dozens of genes with autism spectrum disorders, congenital heart diseases, and schizophrenia, among many others. Additionally, she led an international consortium studying developmental disorders and ident identified approximately 300 significantly associated genes, including 28 that had not previously been robustly tied to these disorders. I could go on and on about Caitlin, but I'll let her speak for herself. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you very much. So I'm a genomicist, and I really like to study patterns of variation in large populations with the goal of helping us understand or interpret the impact of variants that we see. I should really say, I know I'm biased, but genomics is foundational. You cannot have a patient find an advocacy or a support group without a genetic diagnosis. You can't figure out what biological sleuthing you should do without some indication of the gene or the variant that's contributing. And you can't do uh, any therapeutics without some understanding of what you should be targeting. So really, the genetic diagnosis is step zero in this entire process. But how do we actually get there to this genetic diagnosis? Well, obviously, you do some kind of genetic test. Increasingly, we're doing genome sequencing. So that's looking at all of the bases, or almost all of the bases in the genome. But what we've run into recently is the issue with doing this is not necessarily finding the genetic variation. It's understanding what all of those variants do. So in the average genome, we have four to five million genetic variants. Now, this varies a little bit around the world. Um, if you look over to the left, you can see individuals of broadly defined European genetic ancestry, and over on the right are individuals of broadly defined African genetic ancestry. See that climb up from four to five million. That's a lot of variation. The fact is that the vast majority of these are neutral or not really having a very large impact. They are not the diagnostic variant that you're looking for. Even if we were to focus in just on the uh, variants that impact the coding region, these are what make the genes that lead the proteins, we're talking about 10,000 missense variants where you have a change in the amino acid, up to 100 to 200 loss of function variants or predicted loss of function variants, which I'll refer to as PLOF, even up to a dozen, a couple dozen disease-associated variants. So let's filter this one more time. So we take these coding variants and we filter them to rare. So this, we need some sort of reference population here. And what you're seeing at the bottom is the number of rare, so this is an allele frequency less than 0.1% of variants across different genetic ancestry groups, and they're, color, they're in different colors. So over on the far left, you can see for uh, loss of function variation, we're still talking about 10 to 20 rare loss of function variants in every, in every single individual the 100 to 200 rare missense variants, and so on. So we have still quite a lot to deal with. So when it comes to interpreting genetic variation, particularly when we want to get to the point of a diagnosis or understanding a variant that can um, impact risk for developing a disease or developing a trait, we have to integrate multiple different lines of evidence. So genetics is one piece of it, and today we're going to be talking about how we can use population variation to understand the variation that we find in rare disease patients. So argue, I'm not the first to make this argument, I will not be the last to make this argument, but to really understand the variation we see in an individual, we want to understand the variation that we see in the population. So here are a couple of different lines of evidence that we can use when we're coming into this genetic approach. So I'll, I'll note very quickly, of course, if you're in a diagnostic setting, phenotype is incredibly important. I am not a clinical diagnostics uh, doctor. That's not my specialty area, but this is really, really critical. It is a big part of it, 
Um, we're gonna be focusing much more on the genetics today. So you can split it into two levels of evidence. So there's variant level evidence itself. If you have a patient that's come in with a variant that has already been tied to a disorder, it's known to be pathogenic for an individual with a very similar phenotypic presentation, you're in a good situation. At least that looks like a very likely candidate. You may also, however, want to take into account functional consequence. These loss of function variants are predicted to be more damaging usually than missense variants and more damaging than synonymous variants as a class. Or some of these many uh, deleteriousness predictors that are available. All of these are good ways to help you upweight the likelihood that a variant that you've seen is likely to be contributing to your patient's uh, phenotypic presentations. What we'll talk about here today is also, of course, the presence of that variant in the generally healthy population or reference data sets or its frequency within those databases. Because if you're looking for something that's supposed to be causing a rare and severe disease, you probably don't want to see it in that many other individuals in the population. Now on the gene level itself, again, we care about whether this gene has been tied to disease in some manner, particularly disease with similar phenotypic presentations. Possibly you also care about expression. If you're studying a cardiac, a uh, phenotype, probably you want to see that the gene is expressed in the heart. Maybe not necessary, but it would help. And what we'll talk about today is, again, whether this gene in the general population, the relatively healthy population, seems to be able to tolerate mutations within it. So thankfully, over the last uh, decade or so, we are seeing increasingly large data sets of reference populations that have been made publicly available. So the data set we'll be talking about a lot today is the Genome Aggregation Database, or NOMAD. Again, a little bit of a bias here. So this was built out of the Exome Aggregation Consortium in 2014, but thankfully we already had a talk mentioned before that came out last October, November, where we have over 800,000 individuals represented. So this is about 730,000 from exomes and 76,000 from genomes. Most of these are individuals that are coming from case control studies of adult onset conditions. Um, that's just to say no one's perfectly healthy. Just keep that in mind. Or from biobanks. So this is a, a complication in our V4 data set that we're happy to talk to you about afterwards. Um, I should mention, obviously, we're not the only people putting out large data sets. The UK Biobank is a big part of V4. There's also TopMed and all of us who have been doing genome sequencing and releasing hundreds of thousands as well. So I want to draw your attention very quickly for a very brief aside, just to emphasize that none of these populations are globally representative. If you look at the way that I've colored all of these bars, I'm coloring them by genetic ancestor group, which is here um, really actually a measure of genetic similarity that we've put these high-level labels on for these uh, comparisons between groups. You'll see there's a lot of this light blue color, which indicates um, broadly defined European genetic ancestry. So you'll also see this darkest blue Middle Eastern population. There is a line in there in V4, but it is tiny. So this doesn't represent the diversity of the world, and this potentially doesn't represent the diversity of the patients that you will see in a clinic or that are part of your communities. So please keep in mind that your mileage may vary, particularly if you're studying a population that's not well uh, represented broadly. So how can we use these databases? We're going to be talking about, um, again, Nomad V4. One of the most obvious, right out of the gate, ways to use this is allele frequency filtering. And this is primarily done as a way to rule out variants as being far too common in the general population compared to uh, in your patients. So you can use uh, absence, I believe, to some extent as a, some evidence for pathogenicity, but really it's much more proving that it looks much like a more benign variant. Uh, so the idea, oops, spoiled it, that's okay. It's B-A-O-N-B-S-1, B-S-2 for those of you who know this. So the idea here is, again, let's apply one of those frequency filters. If we used about 6,000 individuals of European and Amer African and American ancestry to filter all of these variants at a 0.1% allele frequency filter, what we'd see is potentially 600 to 1,000 variants left for you to filter through. Now, of course, there's other filters on top of this, so you'd want to do functional consequence genes associated with diseases, but that's a lot. However, as soon as you increase your sample size tenfold, 60,000 individuals with better ancestral representation, it drops a lot. 
So this is that 100 to 200 that you were seeing on some of these earlier slides. 100 to 200 is still quite a lot. This is a large burden on our analysts that are trying to put together the clinical data. So really what we want to be able to do here, just to like re-emphasize this point, is that increased diversity, the sample size is obviously critical, but the increased diversity also helps. So this can allow us to rule out variants that are rare in the European population, but not so rare in other genetic ancestry groups. So for example, let's say you have a variant of unknown significance, a VUS, super rare in the European population. What we want to know is whether it's rare around the world, um, and therefore remains a variant of uncertain significance, or whether it's seen a little bit more commonly in some non-European group. And that way you can define it as likely benign, right? It's too common in one of these groups. So as an example of how NOMAD and the increased um, ancestral diversity can help out with this, what I'm showing you here is missense and loss of function variants that would be classified as variants of uncertain significance just based on European frequency. So this is, they're less than an allele frequency of 0.01% in Europeans, very, very rare. And if we use the NOMAD v2 data, we see that there's a little over 400,000 of these variants that are seen at a higher allele frequency in a different genetic ancestry group. So these are variants that are seen at a high enough frequency in another group that we could rule them out. But as we jump to v4, the sample size increased, and specifically the number of individuals of non-European ancestry increased, and we're now at a point where we can uh, rule out 200,000 more variants as not likely being that pathogenic. They're much more likely to be benign given this increased allele frequency in a non-European population. So just as a little push, we know that ancestral representation is important in these data sets. We also know sam sample size and import is important, and both of them are useful when it comes to filtering out variants in your patient groups. So right, allele frequency filtering, the most obvious way to use these large reference populations. However, we can also study the patterns of mutation in these general populations to identify regions that are intolerant of mutation broadly. So this is the idea of selective constraint. This is evolutionary pressure removing variation from the genome. And we're trying to identify genomic regions that are intolerant of these variants and therefore depleted. So the idea is, let's take a relatively tolerant gene or region on the left, and one that's relatively intolerant or constrained on the right. What you see over time in collecting individuals in the population together is that an intoler a, a tolerant gene will show a number of rare differences between individuals in the population, but a constrained gene that's intolerant to all of these changes will be depleted of that expected variation. So this is the signal we're looking for. When we look at the healthy population, where don't we see variation? Because it means it's been protected by uh, evolutionary forces. So we obviously had to create some mutational models that was mentioned just to say that we have made mutational models that can predict the number of rare uh, mutations quite well. If we look at synonymous variants, the observed variants that we see compared to the expected variants, very high correlation. We always start with synonymous because as a class, they're considered relatively benign, which means now that we trust our models when we apply them to missense or loss of function variation. And so given that our model is based just on the sequence itself, it doesn't include anything about selection or what might be important in the genome, we believe that as we see anything dropping off this observed expected line, specifically over here in loss of functions, that that's the force of selection. And you'll note, almost every gene has fewer loss of function variants than we would predict from our mutational models, which makes sense. These genes have been kept in our, uh, in our genome over history f like for purposes, like they serve roles in our bodies. So in particular, we've had a lot of success in quantifying this depletion of loss of function variants, and we've come up with gene level metrics of this loss of function constraint. One of them, the older one, is called PLI, the probability of loss of function intolerance, which is a very dichot um, dichotomous yes-no. It looks like it's loss of function intolerant or it's not. There's about 3,000 genes that we nominated this way. Uh, more recently, we released LUF, is, which is pronounced like the egg in French. 
uh, not my call, but I also can't name things, so it's fine, um, which is the loss of function observed over expected upper bound fraction. And really, this is just saying, this is the depletion we see in the population with some t statistical bounds around it. So as you get to lower LUF scores, you're seeing much more depletion. And just to focus on that, we do see that when we rank uh, genes by this LUF decile, the most constrained genes are enriched for known haploinsufficient, known dominant disease genes in the human genome. That's what we'd expect to see. A nice control on the other side is olfactory receptors, which seem to be removed from the human population with no negative phenotypic consequences, aren't really that lots of function constrained. And uh, for this audience, of course, we also see that de novo, newly arising variants in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders are enriched in these most constrained genes. So I'm bringing this up because these signals of constraint are important to help us determine when something should be a surprise. If you see a new mutation in a gene that the general population doesn't have mutations in, that should be a way to upweight this. And we have seen that these scores have been incorporated um, into clinical guidelines and are uh, quite useful in research to identify novel disease genes. So as an example of how we can use both of these pieces together, uh, I'm showing you an example here, these de novo loss of function variants again in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. There's about two to three times as many of them as we'd anticipate from a mutational model or when we compare to the neurotypical siblings uh, here in green. So in uh, purple is autism, individuals with autism and in blue are individuals with intellectual disability. So there's that two to threefold excess. But if you filter these by two things, totally cleans up the signal. So really, if the de novo loss of function had been seen in anyone in the general population, or it impacted a gene that wasn't predicted to be intolerant of loss of function variants, there's no difference between the neurotypical siblings and the individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. However, we see now much stronger enrichments. So this is how both of these pieces of information can be used. You'll notice I focused a lot on loss of function because they're a little bit more straightforward to interpret. Missense variants are a massive challenge that remain in the field. One, there's tenfold more of them. Two, the, where they occur in the gene impacts, their, fun impacts uh, their function and the specific amino acid change. A loss of function might be a loss of function, but a missense is not a missense across the full gene. So taking missense variation on the gene level is potentially not the right way to do it. Possibly what we actually care about is identifying specific regions that are intolerant. So there's been a few different approaches. You can look linearly, like uh, clusters of exons that seem to be depleted of missense variation. You can look at homologous domains across family members, genes that are in the same family. Uh, with AlphaFold, we have seen a paper out about structural constraint in 3D. These are all different approaches to try to identify where can't you have the missense variant specifically. So just as a quick plug to wrap this up, we do have um, regional missense constraint for Nomad V2 out. We have a more linear approach. We have found at the sample size, power comes into it, that about 30% of all of the genes, their canonical transcript shows differences in the amount of missense depletion that they have. So here you could see potentially the first two exons are really depleted, 25% uh, of their expectation but the rest is less depleted, 81%, and I should say Catherine, Lilly, and Ruchit have been pushing this forward recently. And the reason we care about that is a novel missense mutation in these first two exons, you might wanna upweight a little bit more than a novel missense mutation uh, in the later exons. And of course, all of these, depleted, these very missense depleted regions in the genome are again enriched for known pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants in ClinVar. That's depicted here. Uh, all of these little triangles are path likely path variants from ClinVar. And you can see at the bottom, these colored bars are the depleted regions based on the human, on the, again, the general population. So these are totally separate data sets that are giving the, you the same answer. So clearly here, we kind of already knew what was going on, but the hope is it can help in other places where we have less patient data. So I didn't get a chance to talk about, but all of these databases, these allele frequencies, these constraint scores feed into those large language models that were mentioned earlier to help us predict variants that are, are likely to be damaging. And they also feed into all of the algorithms that we use to try to identify novel disease genes. Um, some of the statistical algorithms looking for a burden of de novo variants. So it's really critical to have these reference populations out there, specifically those with 
diverse genetic ancestry because they can allow us to filter variants based on presence absence, but also on frequency. And they can allow us to find the regions of the genome that are most intolerant to mutation, which we can then use to upweight our samples. And so there's a lot of people before is 800,000 people, but we have not quite as many who've contributed. There's a list of PIs on our website, a large core team. And obviously, thank you to, for all of you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Let's go to this one. If you took a list of all the genes that are expressed in the central nervous system and then priority rank ordered them in terms of the likelihood of causing disease and then correlated that with the ones on the list that are known neurologic diseases, how, how does the model perform? I mean, how many of them, do you pick up all the known diseases and or some percentage of them and how many are left and can you priority rank order? genes right. based on the likelihood of causing disease. Right, so this intolerance to mutation metric is, let's say most of those genes are, um, actually almost all of them are expressed in the brain. So things that are expressed in the brain tend to be really important. Things that are long and central networks tend to be important. So these constrained genes pull those out. Um, however, we do still have I don't know, a thousand or so genes that we've identified as extremely depleted of loss of function variation in the human population, but don't currently have something tied to. So possibly they underlie orphan diseases, possibly we're wrong. I, like, I accept that when we're looking at the genome, we're gonna get a couple of things wrong. Or possibly they underlie pre slash perinatal death. Um, phenotypes that are very hard to study in a cohort of patients that are born. These are the patients that never actually make it into any of our rare disease cohorts. So there's a number of things underlying that. So I don't have a specific answer for you about, here's 12 genes that we think should be important but aren't, but I'm sure we can find a way to rank that a little bit later. Other questions? Are a significant number of those, if you compare knockouts that are non-viable, are they overrepresented in that list? Absolutely. Yeah, I could have pulled that plot out of the paper too. So the genes that we highlight that look the egg score, the most intolerant ones are um, enriched for cell essential genes. They're enriched for mouse knockout lethal genes. Uh, we don't quite have human knockout projects quite as much, but yes, they are extremely intolerant and therefore you can't lose even one copy of them. Gotten up and walked. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, where are genomes collected from uh, for Nomad? Um, is it, yeah? All over the place. A lot of them are coming from uh, sequencing studies that were done here at the Broad for other conditions. So we do, for example, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. We ask the, the people that ran that study, can we take all of your case controls since they've all been here and we jointly processed everything together. Uh, so a lot of it is coming from in-house and that's why, that's, no one's perfectly healthy. That's why, like we do have people within Nomad that have uh, high lipids, right? This is not what we're trying to remove from this population. It should look like the individuals within this room. That's the vast majority and more recently we're pulling in biobanks. So UK biobank is in V4. Um, biobanks obviously all have their own different ascertainment biases, um, which I don't have all off the top of my head, except for UK biobanks I could tell you a bit about. Yeah, okay, and that kind of leads to my next question, which is like, um, what is Nomad trying to do to increase um, the representation of the different populations in the database? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It's one that we think about quite a lot, because you're right, that's a massive European bar. It's not at all representative. Um, so to some extent, we are data parasites. We're, we're, we are reliant on what's available. However, our next release is gonna be pulling in the all of us data set, the genomes there, that 
the All of Us study, for those who are unaware, was purposely targeting individuals underrepresented under represented in these studies. So 250,000 genomes are already out, more are on the way. I think the goal is a million. So that is one data set that we're um, talking to. We're also talking to collaborators around the world um, to try to bring in samples that are that are being generated there to work on a way to have a federated data set. So samples from Australia, for example, can be processed in, in Australia, and as long as we think that they're at similar standards, we can combine them. Um, and that's a way to protect, protect people's data privacy even more so, particularly when you don't want to move country bounds, um, as well as increase uh, ancestral representation. But it's on the top of our mind. If anyone has a cohort that they'd like included, particularly if it's, it's largely non-European, please come talk to us. Um, so I, I wanted to ask the yeah. opposite question of, do you have a list of genes where they're tolerant to being completely knocked out? Yes. Um, well, so or we have a list of we have a list of genes that we see number of individuals in our population yeah. that have homozygous loss of functions. So the reason yeah. I say that is because from a biotech perspective, we're a lot better at knocking things down, whether with monoclonals, siRNAs, yeah. ASOs, CRISPR nucleases, yeah. than we are actually fixing things right now. And so seeing which ones. If you're like in a you know a network diagram of gene function, saying like, oh, I can do something upstream and do like substrate reduction. Yeah. With that so I think that's a really valuable um, idea for a publication or something like that too. There so. was a paper about knockouts um, in the I think it was it was must have been Nomad V or maybe it was XAC or Nomad V2. I know this is another reason for this better ancestral representation is you're more likely to see. Um, homozygous knockouts, like PCSK9, you see in the South Asian population more than you do see in other populations, though PCSK9 uh, itself being found originally in African Americans. So that's a complicated double cross there. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. It's available. Um, and I should say Eric Minical has a bunch of papers about how constraint scores may or may not be useful in therapeutic development. So for patient groups that are largely currently identified by pathology, is there a good way for that group to get in to get some sort of profiling done? Profiling in what um, way? Identifying the, the genes where, that are associated with the, the yeah. pathology. Right. So. Um, there's a lot of rare disease collections. So here at the Broad, we have a center for Mendelian genomics, and we have a patient-forward uh, rare genomes project where patients themselves can sign up to be part of it. Uh, so Nomad itself is much more focused on the general population, but we feed all of these things into our rare disease collaborators. So um, I'd suggest reaching out to one of the many collect rare disease collection cohorts around. Or again, rare genomes project patients themselves can sign up to be part of the, that trial or, or sign up to try to be part of that trial. Excellent. Okay, off the wall question, no sorry, yeah. off the wall there question from coming from this side of the room and yeah. if you need to send me back to Genetics 101, please do. Um, your, your mention of trying to increase the ancestry representation made me think to a friend who is in search of a stem cell donation. Uh, she's East Asian and is having a hard time because most of the registries don't, you know, don't include many people of East Asian ancestry. Right. Can you envision any way down the road if you're successful in expanding the NOMAD database where somehow that could be overlaid onto registries, some other way where, I think you see where I'm going with this, right. that, that it could somehow improve the matching system and make it easier uh, for people who are underrepresented to get the, the, the help they need. Yeah, so that's complicated because a lot of the times these are coming from like blood draw samples as opposed to having stem cells tied to it. So it's, it's almost like, as you say right now, they're kind of like totally different siloed databases. We don't have, I don't think we have anything on the short term plan to be able to do that. The IRB that allows us to do this, sort of Nomad allow, also restricts that we, we cannot release individual level data, we cannot release phenotype data even if we have access to it. But um, I know that there is also a push within the stem cell field to try to get better representation within their, their cohorts and samples as no, well. No thanks, it was a blue sky question, but yeah. it just it prompted. No, no, it's, it is a good question, good point in the field. Yeah, excellent. Okay. I think that's it for me. Thank you.
Dr. Lucas Lunge is our next speaker, and he is the CEO and co-founder of Probably Genetic, a no-cost testing option for rare disease. He is also a 2022 Tremere Fellow. Prior to founding Probably Genetic, Lucas worked for the Gates Foundation's healthcare venture capital arm and for the Boston Consulting Group's healthcare practice. He is a Rhodes Scholar and holds a PhD in bioinformatics from Oxford University, where he worked on the 100,000 Genomes Project. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm super grateful to be able to speak here today. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to the Termier Foundation and to Belinda for um, putting the fellowship program together and then for putting together this day today in collaboration with the Broad Institute. And I'm, I'm really excited to get the chance to talk to you. Um, I feel like I kind of got the perfect setup for many people who spoke before because half the audience or half the speakers talked about finding undiagnosed genetic disease patients. Um, and that's exactly what we do as a company. Um, I'll very broadly talk to you about two different components of what we do. Um, the first piece is how we came up with it, and then the second piece is I'm gonna show you some data that we uh, presented at an FDA working group uh, meeting just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so as I mentioned, the core challenge is how the hell do you find these undiagnosed patients, or at least that's what we focus on. This number we also heard before, which is there's hundreds of millions of patients on the planet who've got these very severe diseases. Estimates range anywhere from 300 to maybe 400 million people. And we think that at least half of them are undiagnosed, and that's globally. And if you break that down to the United States, uh, you're probably talking about 30 million patients who've got these diseases, and maybe 15 million or so of them that are undiagnosed. And the first time that I came across this challenge was, uh, as Catherine mentioned, I, I got to work on the 100,000 Genomes Project at Oxford, and I was a PhD grunt, and part of my job was we would get these EHR excerpts from patients, and we would get 40 email back and forth exchanges between the principal investigator I worked for and the physician who was referring those patients, and then many other pieces of notes, and they would all go to me, to my inbox, and then my job was reading those 50 or 60 pages per patient and parsing out what the phenotype of the patient was because you need structured phenotypic data to analyze a patient's DNA. And once you've done that 20 times, for one, you go completely, completely brain dead, and two, if you've seen four or maybe five patients who have the same disease, you start recognizing these patterns, right? Like once you've seen the odyssey of maybe five or six red syndrome patients, if you see patient number seven's record, you start thinking, this could be a Rett syndrome patient. And so at the, idea, at the time, the idea was, why don't we develop algorithms that we could use to mine electronic health records, and then maybe we can identify these patterns, and if we can, can identify the patterns, maybe we can alert the physician and tell them, why don't you get this patient tested? Because we think there's a chance they actually have a genetic disease. And uh, we did the exact opposite of what uh, Henry Termier would have told you and what many other people uh, mentioned before, which is we didn't talk to any patients at all. Uh, we also, not only didn't we talk to patients, we also didn't talk to doctors, and we didn't look at EHRs either. And we basically just thought uh, this could be a great idea, and then for six months uh, at night and on weekends, developed this prototype algorithm that, given our hypothetical data, as in literally what we thought the data might look like, uh, could identify these patients. And in theory, this worked great. And then we went to the research hospital in Oxford and talked to a professor there who worked on uh, a very specific genetic disease, and we told them, I think we can do this. I think if you give us access to your EHR, we can find more patients. And he said, that sounds fantastic. Which one of our EHRs do you want to get access to? And I, I was like, hold on, how many do you have? And he said, well, we've got four. We've got cardiology, neurology, oncology, and then the one that everybody else uses. And then they showed us the EHR, and not only was it four EHRs, but also most of the data in there was actually scans of handwritten physician notes, and there we were with our hypothetical idea for a natural language processing algorithm. And that was the week before the American Society for Human Genetics meeting 2018, which happened in San Diego, and obviously we realized we just wasted six months of our lives, this is never gonna work. And then I went to the ASHG meeting, and, um, and you'll notice a common thread with many other speakers here, uh, got inspired by Tim Yu, um, and I don't think he knows this at all, and unfortunately he literally just left the room, but, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell him about it at some other point. Um, and in the late breaking abstract session at the ASHG meeting, um, Tim talked about Milas and this ASO approach that they developed, and that in itself was mind-blowing. But the part that was actually mind-blowing to me is what led to Milasen, uh, which was how Julia, who's Mila's mom, uh, and Tim met. And Julia, with her daughter, essentially went on this crazy diagnostic odyssey and was concerned, and like, in her words, uh, was basically at a point where she was seeking out uh, snake oil merchants on the internet to try to figure out how the hell do I help my daughter, and then eventually posted on Facebook this really long post about what was going on with her daughter, 
And Tim's wife somehow saw this post and then told Tim, I think you need to talk to this woman because her daughter sounds like a bunch of your patients. And so that's how they met. And there I was thinking, if that's how they meet, maybe that's an approach you can actually scale. And then I talked to Julia at the end of that um, presentation and I told her about this frustration of my not being able to get into these EHRs and we can't get the phenotypic data and if only we could get the data. And then she said, I know exactly what you're talking about because before Mila got diagnosed, I knew she had an autism diagnosis, I knew she had seizures, I knew she had an abnormal gait, I knew she was losing her vision, and I knew that she could climb stairs six months ago and she can't climb stairs anymore. And in my head I'm thinking those five phenotypic terms, that's literally all I need to plug into my algorithm and make some estimate as to whether or not this kid should get tested. And so that's basically where the idea came from. So kudos to uh, Tim and kudos to Julia for, uh, for sharing that story. And um, I'll just skip over a bunch of these slides, but basically the idea that we implemented on that was if we can just develop the technology that we can put in the hands of this mom or maybe in the hands of some patients and we can give them the ability to give us some level of phenotypic data, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be good enough, we can decide if they should get tested. And that's basically what we built, and this is five years ago at this point. Uh, we built this four-step pipeline where step one is, if we're trying to find Julia before she'd even ever heard of genetic diseases, how the, hell do, how, do, how the hell does she get aware of us? And that's basically marketing, right? Like how do you uh, put your message all over the internet, which is where these parents are, and tell them if you've got concerns, if you've got, uh, or your child has seizures and developmental delay and maybe lack of speech, consider clicking on this link and tell us more about your kid, and that's step two. And in step two, we collect phenotypic data from those families. They submit facial photos to us because a lot of genetic diseases have a distinct facial phenotype. Uh, many of you are aware of this, but if you're not, every one of you knows what a Down syndrome patient looks like because you've seen a lot of Down syndrome patients. Um, and it turns out that same thing is true for a lot of other genetic diseases. So we collect facial photos and lots of other structured phenotypic data. And then based on that, we run all of these crazy algorithms that try to figure out could this be one of the patients we're looking for? And if the answer is yes, we ship them a free genetic test kit. Uh, we run whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing panels, basically you name it sort of depending on the disease, and then get people tested. And at the end, uh, we have a telemedicine platform built um, where people can get genetic counseling done and then hopefully get connected to trials and in some cases even treatments. Um, so that's the really quick uh, synopsis of how this whole thing works. And the next thing I'm gonna talk to you about is um, just some actual data of the of one of the many programs we run in a disease called frontotemporal dementia. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with that, um, Bruce Willis got diagnosed with a uh, very closely related condition uh, about a year and a half ago, and there's lots of people who have those types of conditions. Um, we got approached by a patient advocacy group called the Bluefield Project uh, that works on curing a very specific subtype of frontotemporal dementia. And it turns out one of their main priorities is patient finding. And the reason for that is 15 years ago when they started this effort, they catalyzed this whole frontotemporal dementia industry and got over 20 pharma companies to start developing programs for FTD. And fast forward to today, um, many of them have advanced programs, some even in phase three, and the number one thing nobody can do is find FTD patients. And because of that, many of them are considering pulling out of this industry. And so Bluefield came to us and said, can we do something, can we try to find these FTD patients? And we uh, built a program with them, and I'll, I'll show you at a very high level sort of what the method looks like. Step one is, build the um, really simple looking intake form that just collects the phenotype of these, uh, uh, of these patients. And we avoided past mistakes and did this in close collaboration with the patient advocacy group community and with many patients and key opinion leaders, basically to find what does this have to look like. And then step two is going back to those same patients because we need training data to actually train the models behind this thing. And then we sent out this request, this is one step too far. Uh, we sent out this request to the patient community and tell them, if you can go in for already diagnosed patients and complete our form and tell us uh, what's going on with you or what's going on with your loved one, we'll try to train an algorithm on that. And that's basically step three, which is train the algorithm. You get lots of training data in, both from people who definitively have this disease and from people who definitively do not have this disease. And then you train this algorithm to try to get it to guess, uh, do these patients, patients have FTD? That's step one, get the whole thing set up. And then step two is put it on the internet. And that's what we did. And we ran this for a couple months, and this shows you how fast uh, things on the internet can scale. Uh, we got over 400,000 people uh, to view this with a tiny budget, uh, and we had um, just under 10,000 people submit to the whole program. And out of those 10,000, we then um, auto-selected patients who got testing done. 
one thing that I really liked is people previously talked about uh, how important representation is in these databases. And one key challenge for representation is everybody in these databases looks like the capture area of Boston Children's Hospital and San Francisco and Stanford um, because that's where you get access to the best clinicians who know how to enroll you in these studies. Our capture area looks like this. Every single red dot is an individual patient who submitted to this program. And that's not only the geographic diversity. Basically, every snapshot you could look at, our database looks like the United States in this case. Ethnicities, uh, sexual orientation, household income, whether or not they're single parent households. So all of the above, you can just do that stuff if you put it on the internet. Um, the data that came out of this was really remarkable. Um, the number one metric that we look at is, if this algorithm makes predictions for, we think this person might have FTD, what percentage of people that you test actually do have FTD? And um, for these conditions, the sort of like baseline benchmark that you're trying to beat is roughly one in 100,000 people because that's how many people have that disease. So if you test 100,000 people, at least one should have the disease. And then other studies where um, basically neurologists get approached to enroll patients in these cohorts uh, usually hover somewhere between maybe 2% or 3% of the population uh, that actually have the very specific disease. And when we did this as a pilot program, um, oh, hold on. We had an average 9.4% across three different cohorts we ran this in. So 9.4% of the people that we tested actually had uh, frontotemporal, uh, frontotemporal dementia and genetic variants thereof, which is really remarkable. And um, we are now replicating this effort in lots of different disease areas. We've got programs in, um, I think, seven or maybe eight different disease states. Uh, we work with 45 different patient advocacy groups uh, sort of across the gamut on that and lots of different pharma companies, all of which have the same shared goal of uh, trying to find these frontotemporal dementia patients um, or trying to find patients with their target indication, and in this case, it's frontotemporal dementia. I'll just mention two other components uh, to this that I think are really exciting. One challenge is finding the patients, and then the next challenge is even when you've got patients identified, it can be really hard to then get them into clinical trials um, because it can be difficult to get the physicians to refer them, and it can be difficult to get your messaging to those patients. And because we built a patient-centric platform, we just collect the informed consent from patients right when they enter the platform to be able to recontact them. And we built this uh, product, we cheekily call it, oh, we cheekily call it gene mail. Uh, which essentially is a de-identified interface where patient advocacy groups, uh, soon patient advocacy groups and currently pharma companies can plug in messaging and can just define which types of patient communities do I want this to go out to. And the key here is de-identification. So we don't have to pass on the identifiable contact information of patients who might not want to be identified to a pharma company um, to any players at that pharma company, but instead we can just tell them, if you want this to go out to people who have this specific genetic variant and this phenotype and at this age of onset, uh, we can just get the messaging out to those patients. And then the final piece we heard a, we heard a bunch of talk about large language models here uh, today is, uh, unsurprisingly, we also work on large language models uh, because it's sort of the intuitive thing to do to try to build a better um, you know, algorithmic platform to get these patients diagnosed. And that's, uh, we, we call it chat PG. It's kind of an internal joke, it's not a trademark or anything. Um, but the general idea here is if you can train these models on these specific diseases, they can get better at um, hopefully identifying uh, the phenotype of those patients. They can get better at characterizing age of onset, family patterns, uh, so family inheritance, uh, and a couple other things, and maybe even assist in genetic counseling at some point. Um, that's what the company does. Um, I'm going to skip to the final slide. There we go. Um, very quick synopsis of how we built the platform, what the platform does, uh, some data from frontotemporal dementia. If you are, um, I'll give you a call to action. If you're in the audience and you have a fantastic machine learning background and you love the broad, uh, but maybe you want better pay and join a startup, <laughs> come talk to me. Um, and the same is true if you're a software engineer, if you uh, want to work in operations or maybe even patient advocacy. Uh, we are recruiting across the board, so come talk to us. Thank you. I think we have time for one question. Yeah. Yeah, so that took us a really long time to figure out. And the very first idea we had is well, if parents like Julia are on the internet and they just have a hard time accessing genetic testing, 
if we just make it easily available, they can just pay for it. Uh, but 60% uh, of households in the United States go bankrupt in an unexpected $400 cash event. So you can't do that. It took us a year and a half to figure that out. Uh, so instead what we do is we work with pharma companies who pay us for access to de-identified data on these patient populations. And we fund 100% uh, of the operations out of the cash flow we generate from pharma. And some advocacy groups, actually. Thank, thank you, Lucas. I really appreciate it. Don't shoot the messenger. Um, we're going to uh, continue the Q&A uh, during the networking section. Um, so one of our goals for Rare Disease Day is really to bring patient advocates and patients um, in the same room with tool developers um, and engineers so that we can spark new conversations. Um, our next speaker, um, Michael Siegel, is a postdoctoral fellow in famed CRISPR pioneer Feng Zhang's group um, at the Broad, and he's also in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science at MIT. For his postdoc, he's been working to develop novel delivery vectors for gene therapy, um, and he ultimately hopes to leverage, leverage these gene delivery vectors to enable genome engineering in the central nervous system, um, and um, I'm going to let you tell, him, tell us more about that. Thank you, Michael. Great. Oh, too far to... oh, it's all the way at the beginning of my slideshow, so we get, can some, okay, I'll just go backwards really quickly. Oh, <laughs> you're getting a tour. There we go. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk. Um, uh, I'm here today to talk about how we can use genome engineering and gene delivery vectors to target disorders of the central nervous system. And so on the board here is a classic schematic of the central nervous system drawn by the father of modern day neuroscience, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And I think a lot of people, when they aren't neuroscientists, think of the brain working somewhat like this. There are a bunch of neurons in some liminal space, and they are somehow communicating to one another. But I think this vision of the brain really dramatically underestimates the sheer complexity of the, of the nervous system. So here is an EM, or electron microscope, reconstruction of just one cubic millimeter of the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And each of these different Play-Doh dots here represents a different cell. And so this is a really, really small fraction. I don't want to say it out loud here, but up oh, here. This is a really, really small fraction of, of, uh, of, the, of the brain. And I show this slide to really just uh, magnify or emphasize the, the sheer magnitude and um, hurdles that we face if we really want to bring gene delivery and gene editing technologies to the nervous system to cure a given disease. And so to answer this really overarching question, I've broken up this talk into three parts that we focus on in the Zhang Lab. The first is to identify the disordered regions of the genome that we want to be targeting. The second is to identify new, new genome editing technologies and gene rearrangement technologies um, to be able to directly target these sequences and, and perhaps correct them. And then finally, the third emphasis is figuring out how can we bring these technologies actually into tissues and in specific cell types within those tissues. And so let's start briefly here. So as many of you appreciate, um, and this has been iterated many times throughout the day, uh, there's been an explosion of our understanding for the genetic basis of human disease. Really since the uh, first sequencing of the human genome in 2000, we've really gotten a, a much clearer picture of how many uh, disorders are rooted uh, firmly in single uh, uh, gene mutations in the genome. And so now there are literally thousands of genes that if we were able to directly target and correct, we could literally cure thousands of different um, diseases. And somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of these diseases, so again, literally thousands, are, um, are implicated in uh, disorders of the central nervous system. So we could, if we could somehow uh, target these genomic sequences and rearrange them, we could then somehow um, directly cure or perhaps reverse um, thousands of disorders of the nervous system. And so this is really where our lab's focus has been is over the past decade or so, really trying to develop new genome uh, rearrangement technologies um, to be able to directly target these genetic sequences and, and reverse, um, perhaps change the, the, dis, the, the regions of the genome that are mutated and directly cure a, a given disease. And so to do this, uh, especially in the nervous system, our lab has taken a step back and have had a very productive decade or so, um, turning to nature to see, well, how, how has nature actually um, been able to deploy various uh, tools uh, to rearrange uh, the genome in very precise ways? 
And so just upstairs in our lab right now, we have this really broad range of different species that we're playing with to see, well, how, how have these species uh, uh, figured out new tricks of rearranging the genome? So we have a um, large number of zebra finch genomes upstairs. We have these cyanobacteria, these blue-green algae. And then we also have this much um, underappreciated northern coag um, upstairs in our genome. Sorry, in our, in our lab. And so by exploring natural diversity, our lab, um, largely due to Winston, who is sitting in the front row here, uh, helped develop these uh, uh, CRISPR technologies. Um, and it turns out CRISPR-Cas9 is actually a, a naturally occurring protein that's found in prokaryotes or bacteria. Uh, and it's a, an adaptive immune system that uh, is uh, used by bacteria to ward off viruses. And what our lab and many other labs around the world figured out is that you can actually reprogram Cas9 to be compatible within human cells. And what the power of Cas9 can be distilled to this fact, that Cas9 can home within the genome to just about a few base pairs of the 3.1 billion bases of the human genome. And it can pretty predictably make a um, very, uh, uh, very neat little mutation at that target uh, genomic locus. And so while this was really amazing and powerful initial work, our lab really wanted to see, well, are there any other naturally occurring proteins out there like Cas9 that we could leverage to perhaps perform new tricks or new rearrangements of the, the, the genome? And so this work has spanned the last decade or so of, from our lab and labs around the world. Um, and it's really been the a culmination of a, of, a, of a worldwide effort to sequence new genomes from new strange species found all over the world. And so our lab has identified new CRISPR-like proteins found all the way from uh, West Africa to Hokkaido and, and Japan, um, uh, all across North America, and even in a newly sequenced uh, Antarctic salt lake that recently thawed. And so by looking at all these different genomes uh, uh, of all these new species, we've identified um, hundreds or perhaps even thousands of new CRISPR-like proteins that people in our group have been able to re-engineer to perform new tricks to the genome. And so this is just a, a summary of the different sorts of tricks now that you can do with CRISPR-based uh, technologies um, based off of this long, decades-long effort to characterize new CRISPR systems. Um, and so, yeah, right now we can using normal CRISPR proteins, we can make these targeted mutations. But we can also now make very precise single base pair substitutions where we can turn a single A into a G. And then most recently, again from work done in this building, um, people have developed new technologies to be able to do relatively large scale um, gene uh, insertions at very precise locations in the genome. And all of these different technologies have really led to the explosion of the CRISPR-based um, uh, CRISPR findings in the last decade. And it's really just in the last few months, most of you have probably heard that the first ever CRISPR-based therapeutic was, was uh, approved by the FDA for uh, treating sickle cell anemia. And so we now have these very incredible genome editing technologies that can really precisely manipulate the genetic material we also now have a very profound understanding for the genetic basis for human disease. So the key question is, well, what's the bottleneck? Why can't we use these genome editing technologies to cure a, a neurological disease, or, or at least ameliorate some of the symptoms of a given amelior, uh, neurological disease? And so the real bottleneck is exactly how I started this talk, which is the brain is an incredibly large, hard to access tissue, and there are over 171 billion different cells within the nervous system that we would actually have to correct for, or at least a majority of which, if we really expected to see a physiological um, uh, uh, effect on, on, the, on a patient. And the, to the point that the brain is hard to access, many CRISPR-based therapeutics that are in development now, you can take out a, a given tissue, play with it in a Petri dish, um, and put it back into a patient and, and cure a given disease. But of course, this is not really possible with a brain. You can't take out a brain, play with it in a Petri dish, and then put it back into a patient. And so this is really where the, our lab and the Broad Institute in particular has focused a lot of effort, is trying to figure out, well, how can we actually bring these genome engineering technologies to new cell types and tissues, like the nervous system, so we can actually cure the uh, uh, genetic gene-based diseases. And so, as you may have noticed, there's a theme to the work that our lab does, which is we, to understand how we can deliver these therapeutic payloads to cells, our lab has turned again to nature to figure out, well, how has nature solved this problem of delivering payloads to cells? 
And as we're all acutely aware from the past few years of the coronavirus pandemic and the past few decades of the HIV pandemic, viruses are extremely potent and effective delivery vectors. And one virus in particular, this adeno-associated virus that people have talked about today, um, has really been looked at as a key vector that could be reprogrammed for delivering some of these genome editing technologies. And so some work going on in the Broad right now is, as it was briefly alluded to earlier, is trying to use these naturally occurring viruses to reprogram them to target new cell types and tissues, like the central nervous system. And so here is just a wild type naturally occurring virus that's trying to deliver this pr pink protein to the mouse nervous system. And so as you can see, this naturally occurring virus is not so good at delivering proteins to the nervous system. But Work really that's ongoing right now in the, in the, at the Broad Institute has shown that you can actually use Darwinian evolution to evolve these viruses to gain tropism or targeting to new cell types and tissues in, in, an, in an adult mouse um, and even in a non-human primate. So you can see here that this is an evolved version of this naturally occurring virus. And now, all of a sudden, you can hit the vast majority of neurons in the central nervous system using this highly evolved naturally occurring uh, uh, virus. However, as alluded to earlier, these, these adeno-associated viruses are extremely limited in the sorts of cargos that they can carry, but also in the sorts of patients that they can be delivered to, because a lot of people have pre-existing immunity to them. And so our lab has tried to address this problem by turning again to nature to see, well, what else is out there? Are there any other viruses that we could reprogram to deliver therapeutic payloads like genome editors to new cell types and tissues like the central nervous system? So we've mined all through the, um, the RNA virus uh, virome world, and we've looked at all sorts of different types of viruses and virus-like proteins. And I'm happy to say that we're able to, uh, we've identified dozens of new virus-like proteins and virus-like particles that we can reprogram with all sorts of different therapeutic payloads. So here I'm just illustrating that we can turn these blue cells red by delivering a red protein which is, of course, not so exciting. But we can also deliver all sorts of genome editing tools um, in these newly developed virus-like uh, particle platforms. And now using structural analysis and, again, reporting over some of this other work ongoing at the Broad by evolving these virus-like particles to gain tropism to new cell types and tissues, we can now hopefully deliver, take these particles and these uh, new platforms to deliver genome editors to the central nervous system. And so just to summarize the work that, I've, that is ongoing in our group, we are constantly trying to identify, well, what are good targets to go after with these genome editing technologies? There's a whole group in the lab trying to uh, develop new platforms of genome editors. And then there's a, another wing of the lab, the wing I'm part of, which is trying to develop new delivery vectors to bring these incredible genome editing technologies to the nervous system. And with that, I just want to say thank you to my lab, to Fung, who's been an incredible mentor. And if anybody has any questions about the work that we do, or you want to join, or you want just an uh, informal conversation, feel free to reach out to me or email me uh, below here. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Someone coming from biotech, we've always had a little bit of nervousness around editing in the brain, especially with, you know, it's taken whatever a decade to get an approval for editing, and like, you know, and that and stock prices went down in the context of that approval. So, curious how you think about um, what what context, what disease context do you think would be the first place you would start for genome editing in the brain? Mm. Yeah, so maybe it wouldn't be in genome editing per se, but maybe in one of the adjacent technologies that has repurposed genome editors to do some sort of epigenetic reconfiguration of a, of a, of a disorder of the nervous system. It's a, a number I could think of, but I, 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 I won't go into the specifics. But yeah, may, maybe that, that would be a, a, a potential worry, especially for a, a, a vector like an AAV, which delivers DNA into all sorts of cells. But in the brain, you can imagine that being a problem because most of the cells are post-mitotic. They, they don't divide. Mm -hmm. um, and so you possibly wouldn't want a genome editor permanently being active and cutting um, in, in an adult brain. So. Thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you.
again, we love the lively discussion, and it will continue outside, I promise. Um, last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce Sunitha Malapati. She's the founder of the Buffalo Initiative, which is a first-of-its-kind venture philanthropy fund that supports the work of patient leaders who are advancing therapies for genetic brain disorders in children. She's also the vice president of the CACNA 1A Foundation, a parent-led rare disease research organization that's working to find a specific treatment option for families who are impacted by CACNA 1A-related neurological disorders. Since joining the foundation in 2021, after her daughter's diagnosis, she's helped secure a highly competitive Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Rare as One grant, which is where we met. Um, she's currently working to use the $500,000 to develop novel research assets um, um, for CACNA 1A related disorders. Sunitha previously taught at Georgetown Law and practiced in the private investment funds um, in the DC area, and she's gonna tell us a little bit more about the Buffalo Initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay, okay, great. Thank you, Jillian, so much for the opportunity to be here today and, and the Broad Institute and Tremere Foundation for organizing this event. Um, I couldn't be more grateful to be in a room with folks that are working to cure diseases that impact my family directly and the communities I work with. Um, preparing for my talk today, I actually was taken back almost immediately to May 8th, 2020. We were two months into the COVID-19 pandemic and we were about to join our very first uh, Zoom call uh, with a doctor. It was our very first telehealth, medicine, telehealth appointment. And so this is actually a picture of my daughter on the day of that appointment. She already knew two months into the pandemic to join a Zoom call you had to put on your headphones. And so it was really such a crazy time we were living in and, and my life and, and, and times were gonna, about to get a lot crazier. This appointment with our geneticist that day was years in the making. You guys have heard a lot about the diagnostic odyssey and how long it can take to get a diagnosis, and we were living that. By that point, we had seen every pediatric specialist we could find in the Washington, D.C. area, and we ended up going up and down the East Coast, meeting with neurologists, ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists. I didn't even know that was a specialty. Developmental pediatricians, PM&R doctors, you get the point. We really were seeking answers for the things we were seeing in our daughter. Why her eyes would roll back in, into the, her head all the time. Why she still wasn't walking at two years old. Why she would choke every time she tried to drink something. Why her speech was incomprehensible to anything, anyone but her family. We heard a lot of I don't knows or out, were outright dismissed as worried parents. Perhaps she'll outgrow it, outgrow it they assured us. None of our questions were ever met with satisfying answers, and after three years of this, we were really tired and disappointed. We had prepared ourselves for this Zoom call to pretty much be the same, that the doctor really wouldn't know much about what was going on, and we would be left wondering what happened or what was going on with her. And we weren't totally wrong. The doctor didn't have that much to share with us besides the fact that my daughter was being diagnosed with a rare brain disease caused by a change on her CACNA1A gene. Some of you may know that this gene is associated with devastating disorders like epilepsy, stroke-like episodes called hemiplegic migraines, eye movement and vision abnormalities, balance and coordination issues. The list goes on. We heard from her, the doctor, that my daughter may regress because of cerebellar atrophy. There's no specific treatments or interventions for this disease, she said. And she emphasized very matter-of-factly, there was nothing that we could do. My husband and I could barely get a question in when, you're not gonna believe this, but the Zoom cuts out. It was so early in the pandemic that she was using a free Zoom account to deliver the most life-altering news that we had heard up until that point, and our time was up. Frankly, I was somewhat relieved, you know, we could stop making appointments, we could stop traveling around to different specialists, we could stop recounting her medical history and putting her through invasive test after invasive test. We finally had an answer to explain the symptoms that we were seeing in her. And I was, I was just simply shocked. How could it be that this day and age, in 2020, that we did not have an answer to treat these diseases that were, we were being diagnosed with. 
We were in an unprecedented era of scientific advancement in genetics. We were in one of the most advanced healthcare systems in the world, and there was really nothing that could be done. My honest initial reaction was like, this doctor doesn't know what she's talking about. Would you accept this fate for your child? My girl, she's full of sass, spunk, and I won't even mention what we let her get away with because of those pink glasses. She gives the world's best hugs and a smile that really melts my heart. She's the reason I have developed a healthy disregard for the impossible, where I have found an incredible amount of relentlessness and fearlessness I just didn't even know I had in me. Because of her, I know more about CACNA1A than any MD or PhD can buy you. We really live this journey 24-7. But shockingly, this story is not unique. When your child is diagnosed with a disease only known as a series of letters and numbers that don't exactly roll off of anyone's tongue, it becomes your diagnosis too. You feel like you've been backed into a corner and the normal, easy, choice-filled life you had before the diagnosis leaves you with no choice at all. You must and you will do anything to solve this for your child. How could you not? From the very beginning of the, the diagnostic odyssey to the day of diagnosis itself, you are constantly reminded that no one is going to solve this for you. No one has more stake in this than you. And the questions we are asking aren't being answered. In fact, the solutions we are seeking are not being worked on. Whether your child is diagnosed with a 100% fatal disease or one that is a life sentence like CACNO1A, we face a ticking clock. We must find something to save our child, or we need to get them healthy enough so that their siblings won't face a massive caregiving burden after we're gone. These are the realities parents face. So you can only imagine why there's been a groundswell of parents in the rare disease community over the last decade who have taken it upon themselves to roll up their sleeves and enter drug development after their child receives a similar diagnosis. And that's what I did too. I set aside my corporate law practice and teaching career, and I started to help lead the CACNO1A Foundation, an organization focused on finding specific treatment options for the CACNO1A community. I will admit, I quickly regretted not heeding my parents' wishes to go to medical school as I started digging through every single article I could find on CACNO1A. But over the last four years, we have worked with a sense of urgency that only a rare disease parent has to organize a robust, and collaborative research network pictured here, comprised of the best researchers, clinicians, and biopharma executives in the world, several of whom are in this room today or listening virtually, such as Dr. Jen Pan here at the Broad Institute, Dr. Ann Padori at Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. Yael Weiss, a Termier Fellow and CEO of Mozzie Therapeutics, and Wendy Chung, who was supposed to be the keynote speaker, has, is leading our cacno Natural History Study. We have developed research assets that didn't exist, like novel mouse models, patient-derived cell lines. We have funded translational research in labs all around the world. And this work simply wasn't happening on its own. We, the parents, made this happen. And we, the rare disease parents, are making it happen in so many disease areas. You may have heard of Alison Brent and the work she has led at the Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapeutics after her daughter, Quincy, was diagnosed. Under her drive and vision, the Angelman community went from zero to four clinical trials in just six years. Or maybe you've heard of Terry Pirovalakis, whose son Michael was diagnosed with SPG50. He drove relentlessly to develop a treatment for Michael, coordinating efforts across a dozen research institutions and labs all around the world. As a result of Terry's remarkable efforts, Michael received the first ever gene therapy for SPG50 in a record three years after diagnosis. Terry has gone on uh, to start Alpita Therapeutics and bring gene therapies to more children living with other rare diseases. I could spend the rest of the day giving you example after example of rare disease parents who have come before me and have successfully driven the science and enabled their communities to reach first in human clinical trials for approved, or th approved therapeutics for their rare disease. There are so many. Pat Furlong, which Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, which was mentioned earlier. Ron and Rachel Bartek from the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. 
John Crowley, who developed a treatment for Pompe disease after, after his children were diagnosed. I say all of this because it's actually quite a radical approach to advancing science if you think about it. Our treatment focus groups are developing an entirely new and productive scientific discovery ecosystem that puts people who are actually living with the challenges of these diseases, the people who are closest to the problem, in the driver's seat. We aren't merely accepting a token seat at someone else's table in the name of patient engagement. We are in fact building and setting the table ourselves and we are inviting all of you to join us. When the research agenda is set by these groups, when we have the opportunity to contribute our own expertise and data to the science, you start to see more innovation and progress in ways and new ways of addressing problems that meet the needs of our families. And that is what high impact science means to us. But that isn't exactly how rare disease research is actually organized or funded today. It's not centered around people who are living with the challenges of disease. The systems in place simply don't work with the same sense of urgency that we have as parents. These problems outlined on this slide are very well known. Number one, there's been a lot that's been said about the fact that most potential cures don't actually fit current business models and regulatory requirements are not right-sized to our communities. Number two, rare disease research agendas are set by academia and sponsors and that's what gets funded. Unfortunately, those agendas are not aligned all the time with what's important to our families or communities. And the science sometimes just gets stuck at curing animals in labs instead of progressing to humans. Number three, there's extreme in information asymmetry in the system. Researchers are not incentivized to collaborate with each other, let alone collaborate with our communities. In fact, the system disincentivizes the sharing of data in areas of science where little data actually exists to begin with. It's one of the reasons we have seen so much progress in CACNA-1A research just by virtue of building this collaborative research network where efforts are coordinated because the agenda we have set is ambitious and bigger than any one lab. There's enough research to go around and researchers are starting to collaborate and go after funding mechanisms, mechanisms on their own. And number four, finally, no one has more insights into these diseases than the families and communities living with them. But the work they are advancing is undervalued, it's underfunded, it's underutilized. It's, and it's really no wonder that some of the stats were, that were said today, you know, 95% of rare diseases don't have a single FDA approved treatment. Three in 10 of those children um, are not gonna live to see their fifth birthday. And it doesn't even account for the tremendous caregiving burden on families today. We are facing a massive crisis and we need dramatically different results. I think we heard that again and again today. We need to be investing in new approaches because the ones we have are not moving the needle fast enough for families like mine. We are the ones burdened with these realities and we need to do something differently. The good news is that we're starting to see examples of this disruption. And we're in fact seeing what's possible if we start to organize and fund rare disease work closer to the community. A little over two years ago, the cacno a Foundation received a highly competitive grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and became part of the Rare is What Network. It's a community of what they call patient-led research organizations driven by leaders who have lived experiences in the diseases they seek to accelerate research in. CZI hosted a science convening last fall and showcased the efforts of their grantees, including us, and the incredible science we were responsible for initiating and driving forward. What transpired over that multi-day convening was presentation after presentation of patient foundations that were doing what we were doing, creating and delivering a new mechanism for scientific progress. It had never been more clear to me in that meeting that our systems weren't investing enough in this competitive advantage that we have, our lived experience. And this is where the buffalo comes in. Michael Hun, the CEO of EB Research Partnership, opened his keynote speech at that meeting explaining the difference between a buffalo and other animals in a rainstorm. And for any of you who grew up in the Midwest, you may already know this, but I had no idea until that day that buffalo actually act quite differently. They run directly to the storm to get to the other side and most animals retreat. He likened our efforts in the face of rare disease to buffalo in a rainstorm. A rare disease diagnosis had unleashed a buffalo in all of us, and we were charging towards the storm as buffalo are known to do. And I really just love that framing because it did 
sum up this undaunted nature of the work that these families and parents are doing. I quickly got his effort to join me and name this new effort we are launching today, officially, the Buffalo Initiative. It's a first of its kind of effort that recognizes lived experience as a crucial element of drug development. The Buffalo Initiative was founded by a group of rare disease parent leaders with decades of combined professional experience in fields ranging from business and finance to law and technology, on top of running our own disease research foundations. We came together to create a viable path forward for developing therapies for rare pediatric onset genetic brain diseases. And if any of you know these remarkable women on this slide, you will know that we are forming an unstoppable herd. At the Buffalo Initiative, we believe that sick kids are more than market size, and we simply won't accept that the biggest hurdle standing in the way of finding treatments for the millions of children living with rare diseases today is a lack of investment, a lack of commercial incentives, and a broken way of funding science. That's why we are going to be investing in leaders who are uniquely positioned because of their lived experience to push research in new directions. Patient leaders are unparalleled drivers of therapeutic discovery and development, and we will be backing them to drive the development of genetic medicines. The Buffalo Initiative is launching a pilot to fund organizations focused on pediatric genetic brain diseases, and the funding will go on to support organizations that are advancing therapeutics with robust data from preclinical experiments to human clinical trials. All scientific data collected during the course of these projects will be shared with the larger field to accelerate the development of the next generation of treatments. And we hope this creates a, a flywheel effect. The stake that we take in the upside of these discoveries will go back into making the fund a sustainable funding vehicle for organizations doing this work. Buffalo Initiative is being launched at a time where emerging trends support this way of doing business. We are seeing a path, we are seeing a push for open science precision medicine, the call for more equity in healthcare where patients and families aren't passive recipients and they are not cut, out of in, not cut out of decisions but instead actively and engaged. We are seeing the rise and in innovation of disease consortiums like Combined Brain that are enabling individual disease foundations to make progress more quickly and efficiently. We are seeing the relentless focus of advocates who are working to improve the regulatory environment for rare drug development. And finally, we're seeing the access to increased diagnostics is giving rise to more people that will need to be treated for diseases where no options exist today. In closing, if you want to be part of the Buffalo Initiative, we really enjoy, encourage you to join us. Right now, we're looking for visionary funders and investors to support this pilot project and a broad array of advisors to join our team. As history has taught us time and time again, you should never under underestimate those with the most to lose. The return on our investment is our children, and really, so it turns out, we do also have the most to gain. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita. That's a very powerful presentation. I have a question on the investment. So is it, um, it wasn't very clear to me is how, so beyond the philanthropic donations, how is investment be uh, returned to the investors? Yeah, so this is primarily a philanthropic initiative to start with, and the upside of those philanthropic dollars is to, is the, the goal of the, that money is to basically go back to the fund itself to make a sustainable fund. I see. Not necessarily um, go back to any any investors at this point. I see. And then when you uh, were saying that the to fund the patient leaders, so these are the families and that that, that have the lived experience to push this forward. Yes, that's right. So a lot of these groups are actually driving the science. They're funding the work at different institutions, including you know academic institutions. And the idea would be for them to essentially have more power in the system, to have be able to really put their money where the, their agenda is. And so that's that would really be where the money goes. And and what we're hoping to do is 
as you probably know, most of these groups do grassroots fundraising up through to get to preclinical data, but then you end up getting stuck because it's just so expensive to go from preclinical to, to human clinical trials. And if there isn't a, ready, a sponsor ready to go to help do that, or there's no funding mechanism to go do that, um, that, that science is sort of stuck on the table. And so that, the, the idea would be to fund sort of in that period. So super exciting project, thank you. I want to thank all of the buffaloes in this room. Everyone here today tackles the hardest problems on the planet, and they do it with grace and skill and expertise. Um, I want to send everyone into the networking session pondering one question. For those of us in the rare disease community, every day is rare disease day. However, when we come together again next year, what progress do we want to make? You know, For the scientists in the room, what discoveries are we going to make? What extra experiments are we going to run for the biotech entrepreneurs? What are the platforms that you're going to leverage? Um, what are the emails you're going to send to network? What are the conversations that you're going to spark? Let's really think about where we want to be next year. Um, here at the Broad, we're really excited about our new Ladders to Cures initiative. Um, there will be many opportunities to engage with us at future conferences, um, um, but we're also going to join together with the Termir Foundation again, um, along with um, Takira Rose Foundation um, and Julia Vitarello to host a rock and rare rare disease concert um, to raise awareness about the lived experiences of rare diseases, as Sunitha so beautifully described. Um, and we'll hope you jo you'll join us in April for that. Um, but one more round of applause for the Buffaloes, and thank you so much for your time today. <laughs>